everyone. 372 pages we'll never get back. Michael J. Nelson here. Uh, Connor Lestoka there. There. At, at his location. Uh, this is the podcast, and sometimes video cast. in fact, right now, where we uh, we talk about bad books. And it's the cozy season. It is indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you don't, you don't, you know, you look moderately cozy. Yeah, I'm, I've got a like a sort of like sweatshirt on. Um, I, I, I have a big uh, Frosty the Snowman mascot head in the basement. I'll, I'll bring mm. that out next time. That's my coziest attire. Just the head, right? Yeah, I, <laughs> that's so cozy. <laughs> <laughs> I just put it on. I make sure I'm near a window where like any passing by neighbors can sort of look in. You know, their face pressed up like like Scrooge at Fezzy Wigs. And they see me just wearing a snowman head, nothing else from the, yeah. from the neck down, um, in front of the fire with a my snifter report, my bowl of walnuts, and they think we've yeah. got to move. This is not you, useful property values. Do you sometimes put it on and wear a speedo, and then go down to where they're reporting about the hurricanes, and then go behind the, the newscaster and dance? I've got around. my walk down. <laughs> yep, yep. I've been, okay, you're that I've, guy. <laughs> I, it does not protect against concussions when the when the gale force winds uh, knock you over. I've hit my head several times. If I space out, that's why. Sure. Well, anyway, we're doing. Um, I got to get the title right. So let me. I have scro- not got the title right a single time. Let me scroll up to it so I can read it directly as it says it here. Okay, there's a picture. Uh, it's Sussy Jordan, mm-hmm. a killer, which is dripping in yellow for some reason. The the uh, color behind it is is blood red. Mm-hmm. A killer Christmas affair, different fonts. Cozy mystery. Scroll down. Next title page, A Killer Christmas Affair, A Sunflower Farms, Cozy Mystery, Dog Picture, Sussy Jordan. So there, I think I've got, I think I've covered all the bases. Our confusion or our, our lack of title permanence is understand, understandable considering she can't get it right herself. <laughs> yes. Um, so that's what we're reading. It is a small book. Uh, I, does it even qualify as a novella? I don't know. I, brother, I mean, it's. I think this is going to be just a two-parter, so I think we get halfway through it this time. We read the first seven chapters. It was like 7,000 words, yeah. so probably this, the shortest thing we've ever covered on here. This is a two-hander in the business. <laughs> That's what we call it. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're going to march through this. The I'll bring it up at the beginning. Maybe this is petty. The chapter things seem completely arbitrary to me. Sure. Chapters just kind of... I wrote 600 words chapter end no no like things don't happen like the chapter doesn't go and right at that moment he entered the room he was carrying a gun chapter and there's nothing it's just like no No, it's just like okay you know when we went through the list of all the ones we were considering and we we arrived at this one it was sort of like you know we we picked it it sounded good i was like ah you know you always wonder what you're missing yeah you always wonder what you're leaving on the table fomo Totally FOMO on all the other titles. But but, uh, but I feel like this one is uh, its everything you'd hope for in this genre. It's like, incredible. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the similarities to things we've done before are shocking. How yeah. does this happen? You wonder if there's a cozy council that sort of meets this out. And being like, <laughs> yes. Your character count came in under, like off with their head. It's the uh, Voltari. Is that their name? The council? Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, you come before them with your book. Yes. I intend to kill Santa, and uh, and and uh, my word count is this. Oh, ha, 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 ha. we shall allow it. You will call it a killer Christmas affair. Yeah. <laughs> but they're cupping their enormous latte and sort of like <laughs> <laughs> eating the yogurt off the back. Uh, of the you found a picture of that. I doubt I it. Found a lot I, of pictures of that. You posted it. It's a, it's a, it's a genre. Yeah. <laughs> AI. I, what did I, ha- I? I tried to give it oh, to you generate the thumbnails yeah. for our. Uh, for like you know, posting uh, stuff on on social media, woman licking yogurt off a spoon immediately flagged. They, Ooh, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if it was a combination of things or if you can't have anyone licking anything. <laughs> but like, I had to be like, woman eating yogurt um, <laughs> type of thing. So it's wow, they're uh, ahead of it's us. A, yeah, it's a thin line to have to follow there to get a picture of a yogurt eater. Uh, uh, do you want to just? I mean, obviously the the beginning of this one. Uh, is flagged by both of us. Do you want to just give us the the full experience of the opening of this book? Yes. Yeah, it just right out of the gate. Here we go. Coziness abounds. Uh, boom! Uh, uh, exclamation points. By the way, I just mm-hmm. want to point out 
Does that sound familiar to anyone? Explanation point. <laughs> uh, boom, pop, silence. Silence with an exclamation point. <laughs> Murphy, my Saint Bardoodle, was barking his alarm, which made Carmen, Ophelia's six-year-old little girl, start to cry and, t- and tremble. Uncle Kid, who had been sipping coffee at the kitchen table while Carmen colored in her coloring book and Murphy slept in his bed, jumped up. Who's jumping up? I'm, I'm lost. All right. And started... <laughs> Searching through the house, Ophelia and I abandoned our sugar cookie baking and joined the search. Yeah. We are off to, like, yeah. boom, the starter pistol, go! Yeah. It's like a movie trailer for a Marvel movie. just, like, checks all the boxes that people yeah. are wanting. Cookie baking, uh, you know, a, the man is drinking his coffee, presumably from the coffee. huge log. Yeah. And five characters Yep, in the first two sentences, the first two full sentences. <laughs> One of them is a dog, but that's par for the course. Murphy, Ophelia, but introduced by way of her six-year-old daughter, Carmen, and then Uncle Kid, and then the uh, unnamed narrator, who, we'll get to that, remains unnamed for a while. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, uh, I want to point out, because I brought this up as a joke before, like, this is book one, so they can't be shoveling characters at us. They have to be introduced as we go along, right? No. Oh no, that is apparently a trope of the uh, the cozy verse. Is like just get the the manure shovel out and start shoveling characters at you, and it's up to you to figure out who these people are. It is like I mean, I compared it later when they start just introducing more people because they have a party. But it's like a uh, <laughs> it, it's it's like a David Simon TV show. You know, you're like down at the docks. And then it cuts to like, you know, a, a beer distributor, you know, haggling with the local bar owner. And then you're up in like the, you know, city council meeting as people are just like, you know, debating stadium funding and stuff. And it's like, please, we need to catch up. It's so confusing. <laughs> I guess uh, like who's the dire- Christopher Nolan uh, with time like that? He's <laughs> absolutely obsessed with time. These people are obsessed with characters like it's. We're just going to throw them at you, and you somehow have to make a sense of this jumble of people. And do you think it's because of the mystery factor, where it's like anyone could be the killer? Or is it just like this makes it cozier to have all these people for like a sense of community type of thing? I don't know. Like Agatha Christie did the set the benchmark, and then there were none. You know that book? Sure. There was ten people, right? (laughs) And they came one by one. Like... (laughs) One by one, they were introduced. They came into a house, and then they one by one they die. And like you have to figure out the, how does that happen? Who did it? What's going mm-hmm. on? Ten. There were only <laughs> ten. We get ten in like two paragraphs. <laughs> uh, what was Agatha Christie's? Uh, did she have any talking dogs or like telepathic cats in her books? Oh, was it cozy? Yeah, I don't. I'm trying to. There's usually like it's an English country house or something. I guess that's, that's pretty cozy. cozy. Yeah. 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 Um, well, so they they hear this boom pop and then silence, and uh, it says <laughs> anxiety and chaos reigned as all of us hunted, expecting the worst. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, what, what do you say, Stet? When it's the, the yes, typo. exactly. Thus, yep. uh, uh, sick. Uh, so they're expecting the worst. We looked for a popped light bulb. Or something that fell like a lamp or vase or maybe a log in the fireplace crackling. So the bar for like worse is pretty low at the uh, at the Sunflower Hacienda, I think. Uh, and then uh, we get a good uh, time shift here. Uh, this is the whole chapter. Is a, it's short, but it's a giant misdirect, by the way. And it's very obvious, you know, from... Yeah, and I don't think anyone was fooled, but whatever, <laughs> Uh, we gathered up Carmen and Murphy and led them back into the hacienda. Okay, well, hacienda. Carmen has, has, has wailed, he's dead, he's lying on the ground not yes. moving. In the kitchen, we fixed Carmen a plate of sugar cookies and a glass of milk. Murphy was satisfied with a dog bone biscuit. Hopefully, Uncle Kid can take care of the tragedy outside. <laughs> ah! Time shift! <laughs> we were narrating like in the past, and now we're we're suddenly going into the future. There's your Christopher Nolan for you. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so they they have uh, discovered you know a dead man. She says he's dead. He looks sprawled on the lawn. Uncle Kid examines the large white man. He reached down and yanked an arrow from the man's chest and declared, "Here's the culprit. Someone shot him with an arrow." It's, it's not the culprit. It's the it's the 
implement. Um, yes. And so, you know, it's very obvious, you know, to anyone who's read something like this before that this is a misdirection. It's like the opening, the cold open type of thing. But I, part of me just hoped that this would be uh, how blasé they'd be about an actual murder that took place on their property. Like, yes. You know, yeah, here's the arrow. Uh, yes. Let's go feed the girl some sugar cookies. She just found a dead body. <laughs> Strange uh, way to say the large white man on the <laughs> ground, but I was taking it as it came when, it, when I first read it. Like, okay, I'm going to pretend that I don't know that this is obviously a misdirect, right. and uh, that's that struck out to me. Stuck out to me is a little but, bit odd. So, as Uncle Kid takes care of the tragedy, an hour later he says, "Come on out, y'all. Uh, Mr. Snowman is good as new, and there's a 20 foot blow up snowman outside." Towering and swaying in the wind, and that is a uh, that's enormous. Like that it, is it, big. It, I did, you know you, what I skipped over that twenty feet is big. Have you driven past the uh, the Home Depot twelve foot skeleton at Halloween at all? I have. I was there. We were like renting a truck, and all of a sudden, I walked past this thing, and I was like, looked up, like, who's buying these? They're things? they're they're imposing. <laughs> they're incredible. So it's wow. double that size, and uh, yeah. you know that's like used car lot maybe type of uh, type of. Uh, oddity yes uh so uncle uncle kid kid by the way is k-i-d-d mm -hmm. is that referencing the, the captain i don't know yeah captain kid i don't know whatever anyway he uh fixes the boo-boo <laughs> or so Car no carmen's the dog ophelia's the kid carmen's the girl ophelia is carmen's mom and murphy is the murphy's dog. the dog okay, okay. <laughs> the cozy names are stacking up <laughs> Uh, yeah, it says we all laughed and thanked Uncle Kid for fixing Mr. Snowman before we went back into the warm house. End of chapter one. <laughs> yes. Who, uh, who has um, been around their hacienda with a bow and arrow and, and shot a presumably, I mean, a thousand dollar plus vinyl decoration? I, I, I thought that that was the, okay, that's, so obviously they, they have enemies and it's going to be a thing about... Boy, next time this is, you know, it's written on the side of it or something, next yeah. one comes for you or something <laughs> like that. No, it doesn't, at least in our reading, has nothing to do with it. In the, in the first half of the book, it remains unaddressed, you know. <laughs> it's not the first sense that something is amiss in Sunflower, Texas. Uh, I thought at first, because it was confusing, I thought that, like, you know, Carmen had been messing around with, a, you know, I, I, I guess a bow and arrow outside. She's six, but it's Texas. Um that's also not true. She didn't like accidentally do this and then was upset about it. It's just, no. it's, <laughs> it's a very chilling vision is someone, you know, with this powerful weapon. Cause again, this would be a, you know, parachute grade, like inflatable fabric type of thing, like hard to pierce with, unless you were using a legit, like compound <laughs> killing weapon. The fan to run it has to be fairly impressive, right? Those yeah, things oh. require constant they don't just like inflate and then they're inflated. They have a motor, right? That, that yeah, they're like the, the tube man at the. They're like tube know. man, yeah. So uh, yeah, they would probably pull them down some serious BTUs on that, but uh, I, I guess it's all just uh, par for the course. Maybe when you run a hacienda, we don't know how that works. I mean, I'm thinking like bouncy castle levels of uh, <laughs> motor to to run it. But... <laughs> anyway, all right, that was not the uh, mystery. Presumably unimportant for the rest of the story. Yeah, doesn't matter. Ignore it. Oh, we but just. Then, Learn roll about credits. a bunch of characters, yes. Yeah. So roll, here we go. Roll woke up this morning, got yourself a gun. Um, <laughs> uh, chapter two begins sort of like it introduces Sunflower Hacienda. It's That's where they live. That's where it's all taking. It's an unconventional setting for a cozy mystery, I think. You don't get a lot. It didn't come a lot, across a lot of Hacienda set ones when we were looking at those potential options. I, I was, when I read that, I guess I skipped over it. A Sunflower Farms cozy mystery. Yep, and then, then it's but then it's a hacienda sure also and, and a farm though is that more like a, a ranch like what is a hacienda mean technically? i think that yeah any... i remember in uh in in high school you had to do a a project in spanish class where you picked uh you know someone who spoke spanish and then you had to inhabit their persona to give a presentation and like <laughs> rage against the machine was talking about these like rebels somewhere called the zapatistas in the 90s rebels then, you say I, I, who lived in the woods out in yes, the jungle yes, i mean yeah they were they were had been uh, exiled from the underground community <laughs> sure, sure, yes. so i was very interested in this anyway there was they were took their name from a guy named emiliano zapata so yeah, researching zapata. him he had nothing to do with the rage against the machine it was i was very disappointed that there was no uh 
um, you know, bulls on parade. But you t- you'd heard a lot about haciendas because that's what all the rich guys owned in Mexico in the turn of the century type of thing. So okay. th- that's my so, one association with haciendas is that so, these, so really central building content. out yeah. outbuildings. Lots of people can live at a hacienda. Yeah, I guess so. And in it's Texas, like, in it's like a dude ranch, but who it's knows? Spanish. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. probably a place you would have you would they rent out for weddings at this point in time. Uh, and here's where we get. Um, I'm just going to read this as it uh, as it is presented to me. Okay. <laughs> Sunflower hacienda appeared incredible with all the Christmas decorations up. I was so excited to finally get rid of the construction crews, sawdust, painters, and plumbers. <laughs> We cleaned up from the top to bottom, and 15-foot Christmas trees looked beautiful with the balls tinseled and colored lights. Wow. Even the outside of the hacienda looked magical with all the tiny twinkling lights. I couldn't wait to show it off to all our holiday guests. <laughs> just dole them out. Just sprinkle them in at random. <laughs> yes. It's like who gets the uh, almond in Christmas uh, dessert. Like it's, it's good luck if your sentence has an exclamation mark at the end of it. Right. <laughs> Uh, so they, they do have to adjust the coziness factor based on it being there. Uh, in Texas, it says hot chocolate and apple cider would complete the Christmas vision. But it's Texas, and the weather outside was still tapping into the high 70s, so iced tea was the drink of choice. So I was like, this place isn't fit to, you know, wipe Christmas River's butt here. <laughs> no like, what way. are we doing here? <laughs> we, you, you're never going to get, what was it, four feet of snow? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, overnight, like the yes. storm of the century. Yeah, oh, the, this is yeah. just that unholy, you know, when we lived in San Diego and it would be, uh, you know, December 21st uh, and they have 80 degrees, you know, fake snowflakes up or when it was when it was Thanksgiving, they have fake fall leaves just sort of like going along with what the East Coast does to celebrate their holidays. Yeah, my first Christmas in uh, San Diego, it was like 85 and my kids who were, you know, expecting Christmas we're like cutting pieces of cardboard to block out the sun from our windows and stuff. <laughs> like, this sucks, Dad. I'm like, I'm sorry, man. I can't do anything about it. I can't get blinds. What do you expect me to do here? This is <laughs> put away that hot chocolate and apple cider and grab some yeah. iced tea. Damn it! Drink some cardboard. Come on. <laughs> uh, th- so they they keep new characters keep coming. Marisol is here checking a to do list. Uh, and the the basic scheme here is that they have invited everyone in town to a Christmas party because they've renovated this family hacienda into a hotel slash farm slash bakery. Yes, um, that's getting ahead of it, but that's that's what's going on. Yeah, that t- it do- it's not immediately clear because it's just you're trying to keep track of the characters. Who's this? Who's this? Wait, who? What? And then in the middle of it all. <laughs> You get this little uh, tidbit, and there's a lot of characters, so stay with me. Okay. Like Uncle Kid, Aunt Lucy and Aunt Lindy were born at the Hacienda and grew up here. Okay. Uncle Kid never moved away, so that guy's just a fixture. He's like my uncle who saved his his poop in buckets. He's just at the Hacienda. (laughs) Uncle Kid never moved away, but my mother... Aunt Lucy and Marisol's mother, Aunt Lindy, moved to Austin and went to the University of Texas and raised their family. Okay. <laughs> you reading it out loud made me completely reevaluate how I interpret this sentence. Oh, what, what are you thinking? So, me and other readers who, listeners who, who wrote in, read that her mother was Aunt Lucy. Oh, no, no, like, no, no, this my is very mother, odd, comma, my mother, Oxford, comma, Aunt Lucy. So three people, I think. No, it's not the Oxford, comma, because Aunt Lucy and Marisol's mother, Aunt yes, Lindy. Okay. okay, sorry. It's not the um, So, yeah, I, I was very confused by that. This doesn't make it any less confusing because her mother, as far as I can tell, is not a character in it for the rest of the book. Okay, but there are three people. My mother, Aunt, Aunt Lucy. Lucy and Marisol's so my mother, mother unnamed, Aunt, Lindy. Aunt Lucy, yes. and Marisol's mother, Aunt Lindy, moved to Austin and raised their family. Yes. So the so. aunts raised a family together? Uh, well, and her mother, too. It and seems. her mother? At the University of Texas. Okay. And then here we go. This is the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're doing that thing. You're doing the cartoon. Blah, 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 huh? <laughs> After their husbands were killed in an accident, they moved back to the Hacienda to help their parents with Sunflower Farms. Uh, What is that? (laughs) Not the mystery again. Uh, More misdirection. 
unrelated. I mean, sort of unrelated, but some that's the reason they're all back at the Hacienda. Yes. And so they d- had a commune at the University <laughs> of Texas. <laughs> yeah, I don't and know. And then somehow so- an accident, like uh, I'm, I'm assuming like molten steel was poured on their husbands at the... At the plant or so. I don't know. What was the oh. accident? When FBI agents raided their compound in Waco, they were <laughs> they were they the, managed to escape. But... The fire swept through. And... <laughs> uh, I just said, I hope this is never mentioned again. This <laughs> unnamed accident that is just. Um, and it does. So the fact that you revealed that this is was three people. Um, was her own father killed in the accident? Because it says they are husbands and they've just referred to three people who moved to Austin and went to UT and raised their family after their, uh, yeah, I guess all three. So brothers-in-law, right. Of all three uh-huh. guys, and then they moved back, but her mother is not here. It's just the two aunts. So it's presumably is not talking about them. That's why I thought her mother was referred to as aunt Lucy, you know? Okay. So to help their parents. So yeah. what are, who are their parents name? What is, who are the parents of Uncle Kid, Aunt Lucy, Aunt Lindy, and her mother? Well, so <laughs> this is difficult because, like you said, unnamed mother, the narrator is still unnamed at this point in time and will be for, I believe, four more chapters. Uh, so it's very hard to tell how old she is because we don't know anything about her. Aunt Lucy and Aunt Lindy are about to be introduced. They're sort of like batty old, uh, you know. 60 somethings i'm guessing so i think we can presume their parents are dead and they've taken over the thing and that's why they're renovating it they probably you know the the last breath went out um the body was was cold bam we got to start renovating this hacienda boom death silence um (laughs) okay so then help me out with this this is the very next after the the accident which again i i I don't know, like spectacular uh, yeah. bulldozer scissoring three men in half, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> now that they are getting older, Marisol and her husband, Simon, and I have moved back to Sunflower Farms. Oh, OK. OK. Marisol. Who's Maris? Aunt Lucy and Marisol's, Marisol's Aunt mother. Lindy's daughter. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> It's Charlie Day at the wall, you know, like it's that, yes. it's that type of, uh, um, wow. But this is a uh, Hallmark movie catnip, right? Is re- moving back to your old town. Well, to, sure. You know, to take up the business after a, a loved one dies or something. Marisol's mother. I, I, I really, I would have to, do you ever do that? Like the, the other day, my, um, Bridget's niece's husband oh yeah it's gave me something i'm like what do i call him yeah because i want to say oh my my nephew but it's not my nephew what is the name for it? So anyway <laughs> those things i cannot hold them in my head like the cousin once removed all of that i, I don't well, know this book is. is yeah gonna be this rough for anyone with tough. that inability <laughs> especially Marisol's when mother's mother and, and, and her Lindy. husband simon and i moved back were they living together? <laughs> well, the communes appear to be a uh, a strong thing happening here, and we know now we, we'll learn that about the ants. Uh, ants sort of like hippie proclivities. So it's yes. uh, I okay. don't know. I think it's, yeah. Um, All right. uh, and then it says here um, they're they're sort of doing the thing where everyone obviously knows what's going on, but they explain it out loud because the the, list, the reader does not know that. Uh, they're talking about tomorrow's party. Uncle Kid and Simon, you are to haul a large log and put it in the fire pit for the Yule log and then put up all the wreaths on the outside. I don't know who's talking. Oh, okay. There's many sentences and then it says who's talking. Darby and Ophelia, you know your assignment. Food, food, food. Mikkel is going to help me get all the chairs and tables set up, said Marisol. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't want to spoil it, but you, you, I have to, but... She says Darby and Ophelia. Darby is our narrator. Okay, so the next paragraph is a is quotations, but it is unattributed. Okay. So is that the narrator? So Marisol gives these marching orders. She gives it full. Nobody <laughs> interjects or says, sure, got it. They, they just like... She literally says, you know what you have to do, but here I'm going to tell you again anyway. Then someone says... I love it when you take charge, Marisol. You are our family's general. <laughs> and it goes on for like a paragraph and a half and then says blah, blah, blah. And little self cellophane bags so they can take the cookies home with them. End of thing. 
unattributed. And then I look down at my feet where Murphy. <laughs> so what is it? Our narrator? I think it's like a, a a tinny speaker in the corner of the room where occasionally, like the the voice from Saw, just be like, "I love it when you take charge, Marisol. <laughs> you are our family's general. We've hired Divine Catering to help with the food." Or Lawrence they... Galloway as our bartender. Lawrence Galloway. He gets the full name both times he's referred to. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's the uh, speaker in MASH where it has, like, omniscience and it talks to you. It t- kind of tells you what's going on. <laughs> or uh, Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny. Right? Yes. <laughs> Narrating Thumbelina. And it uh, might be a serial killer because he says, despite what they said sentences earlier, that it's uh, the high 70s in Texas and cocoa and cider are – we shouldn't be drinking that. Most people will drink eggnog. <laughs> Twisted stuff. And then uh... – Here's another one where the paragraph starts. Oh, one more item. Douglas, since you are our security person and handyman, we need you blah, 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 said Marisol. Okay. That's seamless. It's, uh... Wow. And then a switch up. Uncle Kid spoke up in his slow Texas drawl. Oh, yeah. So this last an attribution that you go, okay, now I know who's speaking where are they in the hacienda? How many people are there? Who moved back with whom? Who lived where? It's incredible. Right. One person is described, and fortunately, he's described as pretty much Sam Elliott. He's got this slow Texas drawl, and he has a weathered face accented by a handlebar mustache. Absolutely so, right. From now on, I can picture him just perfectly. Yeah, and he goes on. He doesn't say it yet, but he goes on to say you know, some, uh, some folksy Texas kind of stuff. So it's pretty exciting. I've never moved off the hacienda. I can't read. I don't do my ciphering very well. Damn shame about that accident your husband's had. I felt lower than a snake in a wagon wheel trough when I heard about that one. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go take a dump in a number 10 can bucket in my bedroom. (laughs) Good night, Uncle Kid. Really going to appreciate that when I leave it to him. (laughs) Um... (laughs) Uh, Douglas, the marching orders he's given were to uh, install the security cameras and the app, which, you know. Yes. There we go. That that sort of setup is something that they have access to from then on. Yeah. I thought these things you were supposed to go, well, we don't get a signal up here. And then you don't, you don't, they, they're doing the opposite. Like we have a lot of cameras. Yeah, we got to really make sure they work. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, after uh, Uncle Kid is um, given his attributes, they would, then we get to um, meet Aunt Lucy and Aunt Lindy. They looked like two hippie pixies. Both were petite, identical twins, now in their early 60s with salt and pepper, loose curly hair. They always wore multicolored broomstick skirts with peasant blouses and lots of jewelry. They owned the Mystic Herbs and More shop at the entrance to Sunflower Farms parking lot. So... As much as you can picture the Sam Elliott guy, uh, I have no idea what we're taking away from here other than they're sort of like batty, natural matches and hippie kind of ladies. Yeah. I, you know what I immediately pictured was, uh, you know, at Sean's wedding, we were at, uh, uh, what's the, uh, the Joshua National Tree. Park? Joshua Tree. Right outside of it, there is a commune that was built in like the 50s, I think. Oh, yeah. And you toured this place? We stayed at it they're inside of they're selling off little bits of this commune but it has like a temple with kind of like buddhas and stuff and then there's a, a hippie crystal shop at the entrance <laughs> to it right by the parking lot and if you went in i think you would see people in their early 60s with salt and pepper loose curly hair wearing got it broomstick uh yeah mystic <laughs> herbs and more shop perfect yeah so. yeah i guess if you've seen it you can picture it right away it's like yeah. a uh, sedona arizona type of place but that's Texas it. and crystals. I guess if you're reading Cozy Mysteries, you know what a multicolored broomstick skirt is. But that <laughs> sent me scrambling to the... <laughs> and they do not look like a broom... I don't know what the association is. I guess you could wear them if you sat on a broom? Yeah, sort of witchy, but... Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. They twirl well when the uh, when, when drums in space starts at the, at the dead show. Yes. You got <laughs> There's twirlers. Uh, so then... We're still dealing with, you know, I'm still reeling from the accident that killed all three of their husbands. <laughs> and the, the hippie hippie chicks are, are selling herbs and crystals. Uh, but after Mikkel, Ophelia, and Carmen left, 
Only Marisol, Simon, and I remained around the table. So they were around the table. I didn't know that. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's important. That's where they were doing their planning. It's their war yes. rooms. Uh, and that's where she introduces that, she, um, I think Marisol says this as well. Uh, oh, no, it's Simon. It's, it's another long paragraph where you don't know who's talking till the very end. <laughs> Uh, I believe we would always have regretted not trying if we had not moved, but I'm still worried we can fail. I just know the event center and your bakery, crust and jam, oh, God. are your dreams. So our, our our narrator, unnamed at this point, per Cozy Law, also owns a bakery called Crust and Jam. And the uh, the the ants in the multicolored broomstick skirts are going uh, herbs and more, crust and jam. Bit of a rip-off, I think, <laughs> but uh, we'll allow it because sure. we're hippies. It's all yeah. cool, man. It's and you're going to be changing that name pretty soon, I think, because it is not a good name. It's no. not necessarily super appealing. Like, No, no. It's like the uh, there's ads for – there's the sofas that are like these units you can you can put together and you can take the fabric up. They're called love sacks. Ugh. And they said since the – you know. 30 years, Love Sack has been the leader. <laughs> like, crust and jam and Love Sack together at last. There's a faded side on the side of the road. Free Love Sack. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> anyway. Uh, uh, and then they introduced the one other like sort of hallmark law is that it says, as I'm hoping as Sunflower Farms begins to raise fresh fruit, vegetables and fruit, we'll be able to make an impact on the hunger situation of families living in poverty in Central Texas, responded Simon. <laughs> Simon, so they all, the professor, right? Simon, He's the a, former professor. I oh, think. sorry, former. He moved back to. Yeah, okay. he gave up his lucrative tenure job to come here and uh, and landlord for the hippie crystal shop. <laughs> But they all have hearts of gold, so that's important, yes. too. Yep. Uh, oh, yeah, it says, you gave up a teaching career as a professor at the university, but your hopes and goals are even greater than ours. Uh, that's, Mar that's Marisol. Okay, yeah, they're still at the table. Yeah. If, you, if you're keeping track, there's a big table. She sent, Doug, what is his name, Doug, the security guy off? Doug, the security guy to install the cameras. Uncle Kid was way past his bedtime, so he got up and left. Yeah, he's I assume he's last sig outside. Yeah, he spit some chaw on the table as he left or something. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna see you cats and, and dudes later. Yeah, I'll be up with the chickens. <laughs> and that's where the chapter ends. Like you said, they sort of just like you know, it tip topples yeah, over and crash uh, it into a pole, like a twenty foot it. snowman. Yes. Uh, chapter three uh, is is the rest of the book pretty much takes place in this day because uh, this is the day of the big party. Um, <laughs> and she says, I can't wait to see how it all turns out. It's going to be beautiful. And all this sort of setup and coziness that she lays on thick here is vastly improved knowing someone's about to die. Yes. Uh, so now there's a long thing about um, alarms, mm -hmm. the cameras. App uploading. App uploading. Doug uploads an app to her phone. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I think Sussy is definitely still paying for her AOL uh, email address. <laughs> she thinks you need to have someone else upload an app to your phone. Uh, the cameras are filming all the time, so they're, they're using film in these cameras <laughs> nice, <that's laughs> instead <good. That's>... of <laughs> so instead of streaming, they're just filming. Whatever. Yeah. Um, but then we get. So then the, the party people come in. I don't know. I have something a little deeper. Do you have anything before that? The uh, party starts. Well, she says, he says you should turn on the app notifications. And it says, oh, I have a second alarm, too. Murphy gets up and growls or barks if anyone's snooping around outside. When we had all the construction people working on the renovation, he was constantly growling and barking if it was early in the morning or late at night. So I was like, oh, the St. Bernoodle is, is one of those kind of dogs, you know? <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> all, the, uh, all the help is sort of sets up as an alarms. He sees the uh, star forward on the high school basketball team and starts barking at him. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, Murphy, settle down. Uh, but this is where we get um, and see if you see if this brought anyone to mind. Uh, as he finished, as we finished, I heard the back door open and saw Judge Ed Simpson coming into the kitchen. Ed is the retired county judge. He's eighty-two years old, but he says he's not dead yet. <laughs> Age is being mentioned. Does that remind you of anyone? It's very specifically 82. Yep. 82. <laughs> Perfect. And he says, how often does he say that? Because that has to be like, <sighs> there was this guy at my uh, 
at my church. He's since passed away, but he, I'd be like, hey, how's it going? And he was one of those guys that talked out of the side of his mouth conspiratorially. Wow. And he was like, well, I'm... Uh, I'm upright and breathing. That beats the alternative. And it'd be like every time. You go, good Lord. Ah. <laughs> well, have a, have a good day. He's, he's a sweet guy, but it was just like, that was his thing. This huh. is the judge comes in. Hey, judge, how are you? I'm 82, but I'm not dead yet. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I just need you to try on the Santa suit, okay? You want to uh, you want to uh, come on over and catch the uh, Mavericks game? Well, I'm not dead yet. You can say yes. <laughs> you you just, just say yes. You don't need to. <laughs> but as he says, it says as he says, he's not dead yet. Yes. So as he's always saying this, he's also referring to himself in the third person. Yeah. He's not. No. He says it. Yeah. You want to go get I... a beer, Judge? He's not dead yet. Who, oh God. Who, who's not? He... Oh, I was. Ref- I was referring to me. Should I, is there a different way to phrase that? <laughs> I am starting to lose it. I mean, I, I'm I, not dead yet. I'm 82. My, my facilities are not there. I I really ought to get off the bench. I have I have sent some some very innocent people to prison. <laughs> um, this is something I have to remember to say when I enter a room. I'm fine and looking forward to being your Santa for the party tonight. No matter how rambunctious the children are tonight, they'll be no worse than this business with Paul Turner. <laughs> just any time I enter a room and just have people go, what? What are you talking about? Are you, are you clumsily trying to introduce characters, Mike? That's... Who's, who, who's Paul Turner? Well, I'm funny you asked. Glad you asked. It's uh, like an Uber driver bringing up things. Yeah. And that's when I worked with Johnny near Nashville. Oh, God. Uh, who's, <laughs> no, I'm not, all right. Who's Johnny? Johnny Cash, we <laughs> called it. <laughs> oh, one Paul. star. My figure is hovering on the one star. <laughs> yeah. Paul Turner. Paul Turner is the second guy to, I think, get referred to in the, uh, um, with both names after the Lawrence Galloway, the bartender who has already mentioned Lawrence twice Galloway. with his full I name. Love it. Paul Turner is essentially the Brad Wesley of Roadhouse of this town. Yeah, he uh, brought the uh, Photoshop or the photo yeah. mat here. Yeah, <laughs> but because it says he's he's like a big developer or something. It's uh, if Paul's development company gets the permit to build the big apartment complex, it will completely change the atmosphere of Sunflower, Texas. I also refer to the town I live in by its full uh, name and state that it's in, just to remind yes. people. I like the quaint little artisan village feeling. I commented, like I was. Uh, I just, commented. Just, <laughs> just throw being, cozy in there you know yes. if you're gonna be like it's very cozy here but then um unattributed two paragraphs of quotations about paul turner always his full name please mm-hmm. um he's a very determined man and i don't know what he'll resort to in order to get his permit but i can tell you one thing for sure he'll never get my vote as long as i'm on the board who's talking who is this? Because <laughs> then it goes to, well, for tonight, you can forget Paul and his politics. Okay, now we figure out who it is and yes. be the jolly old elf. Okay, yeah, so. We figure it out, but we still don't know who our narrator is here. <laughs> no, we don't. Uh, but yeah, that's a, uh, that's a okay, R.I.P. judge, uh, while, you're, while you're making these bold claims about not dead yet. And as long as I'm still kicking, he'll never get this thing that the rich guy desires. Well, that Paul Turner and his politics, he's not dead yet. Now, was that in reference to Paul or you in this situation? I'm confused. I'm, I'm 82. 82. I don't know. Where's my, where's my keys? I... <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, people start to arrive, I think. Uh, do you have anything before the catering company arrives? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. Uh, but, but anyway, Paul is going to be dressing as Santa and like reading to the kids um, so everyone's very excited about that. But then the catering company, Divine Catering, arrives. Yeah. And the, whose owner is Phyllis Newton, shows up. And <laughs> this, this is just some sample dialogue. I read this to Lauren while we were uh, having coffee around the table this morning. I know you want this party to be elegant, so we thought glass cups would create that mood better than red Dixie cups. However, we've included lots of juice boxes for the children since the eggnog will be spiked. Yes, and I see you have glass plates for the snacks, too, I, I said. Oh, yes, and we have crates that we'll leave in the kitchen so that our catering staff pick up dirty dishes. 
they'll be able to bring them to the kitchen and put them in the crates. It was it reminded me of the women talking and setting up a room. I was just going to say it has <laughs> to be setting up a room. <laughs> I hadn't noticed yes. the pegboard. Yeah. I, I see like, that there's a craft station over there. They yes and each other in the mildest ways. Like, <laughs> yes, and the door will swing open here and it won't hit the chairs that we have put against the wall. That is correct. We have also... <laughs> Oh. Uh, I guess I did. I have one thing uh, that was before that because uh, the judge. Um, yes, he, Judge Ed. He isn't dead yet. Uh, kind of a slam on uh, certain children here. The chair was large enough to hold Santa and two or maybe three children. <laughs> <laughs> judge Ed said it was perfect and he could imagine lots of parents taking photos. So maybe just go with two children for sure. you uh, there, Johnny. Um and uh, uh, stay away from that juice box while you're... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Lawrence Galloway's son, Billy, is always uh, looking at <laughs> one of those huge lollipops and waddling around yeah. in his sailor suit. So, Two or three children. That's a, that's a good measurement of chair size. <laughs> <laughs> it's very... It's Elias, Elias Ian in terms of being like... He was around 21 feet tall. <laughs> uh, which brings me to my first Sonic challenge for you. Oh, boy. As he left... This is the judge, I believe... He's not dead yet. As he left, he turned back and shouted, <laughs> ho, 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 and chuckled as he went out the door. Okay. So you may need to back off. I don't know. I will. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. I've, I've, I'm leaving. I'm 82. And yes, I'm you're 82. Ho, ho, ho! <laughs> uh, God, that judge is a weird dude. What the hell was that? Very unappealing. He's really slipping. We've, he, he, <laughs> he can't preside over that drunk driving tile next week. That is not going to go well. <sighs> term limits. Term limits, man. This guy cannot be a judge. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Phyllis, uh, what was that? Phyllis Newton, then uh, her crew starts hauling stuff in. She introduces her to the three servers, Bailey, Jerry, and Mandy. So that's it's getting Ellisian. Um, yes. with the amount of characters and uh then she says uh is there a bathroom where they'll be able to change into their weight clothes before the party sure let me show you the nearest bathrooms are down this setting up a room down this hall from the gathering room i was just showing santa the bedroom across from the bathrooms well he'll be changing into his santa suit later this evening end of chapter <laughs> end of dramatic That's end Move along. That's where I have the the absolute. She does not know how like chapters work or what divisions are or what they don't signify anything. But uh, here, I just want to um, I just want to tease you with this one. Uh, I laughed and said, except for the cookie decorating table. Phyllis smiled and said, "I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. I know, I'm teasing." <laughs> what? I know it. It really hurt. Unnamed narrator. It's you shouldn't tease, especially at the holidays. I've told you I have a friend who does that's his form of teasing is just like just to lie to people and just misdirect them. Like I'll go to lunch with him and he'll say like and he knows that if he's listening to this he won't care because I've told him <laughs> you can't do this. He'll be like, Hey, do you have um I notice you have walnuts. Do you have the walnut shells to a waitress or something? And he'll be like, I'd just like to eat those. We just did a flat voice, and she'll go, um, I mean, uh, maybe. And then he'll go, I'm kidding. And I'll go, like, that's not, why is that, it's not a joke. It's not kidding. Also, it would help if you smiled or gave some indication. Yeah. It's just like a weird, like, what, I don't, it's not humor. It's you not. can't be, like, rubbing a knife while you ask for walnut shells. That doesn't. Please phrase it in the form of a joke if it's supposed, I'm, I'm kidding. Yeah. No, no, you weren't. You're just we, lying. This is a weird lie. We all know how how joking with a wait waiter works. You like they bring you something like you had the hamburger. No, we didn't order that. Hey, but if it's free, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it isn't on the menu. Oh wait, no, that I can't. <laughs> um. So anyway, yeah, Phil. I'm sorry. I can't help you. I know I'm teasing. Great teasing. Wow, she burned. <laughs> Oh, all right. End of chapter. Yeah, end of chapter. And so I guess what the whole thing is, is that, yeah, she took the judge down the hallway to her bedroom and um, shows him, like, this is where you can change into your Santa suit and then come back down. That's the yeah. whole. With a weird description of the bed and why she chose it, right? 
Oh yeah, it's uh, right. Yeah, this is that was very weird, and I didn't highlight it. The room once it talks about the you know big four poster bed, like ornately carved. Uh, the room once belonged to my grandparents when it was their home. I sleep in the room because it's convenient for me to start cooking and baking early in the morning for the crust and jam shop. So how big is this hacienda in terms of like there's a spot that's more convenient? Like, is there like a part of it that's connected by light rail that would be like really annoying <laughs> to get to? Like, I guess so. I, and then I just like that she leaves. So that's her room. She leaves Judge Ed alone there. He immediately like opens all the drawers and yeah. finds her under things. Well, well, like, well, yeah. Hey, yeah. Payday. Court is in session. <laughs> I'm banging my gavel against this thing. And I don't object to any of this. <laughs> all right. Yes. That, uh, cozy. Uh, we let's do oh uh, hell, let's do real or fanfic. Why not? Fanfic. All right, so this is Real or Fanfic, our segment where Mike is going to try to guess which of these five segments are either from later in the book, A Killer Christmas Affair, or fanfic written by our beloved Patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash 372 pages. That's where you get every episode early. You get, uh, you've been posting stories, crazy stories from your past verified by someone who was there lately. Those yes, verified. And then um, also, um, we have to do something about Marshall Brodeen at some point, <laughs> we had who some lived crazy... in my hometown. The coincidences were off the charts. The most insane Bader Meinhof we've ever had, former That's magician crazy. and TV clown Marshall Brodeen. If that doesn't sell you on signing up for this, who's, I don't know wh whose clown name was Wizzo? <laughs> so get your string Talk board set up yeah, 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 yeah get it going uh, so yeah that's uh we appreciate everyone who does that it was a uh, a fun fun year over on the patreon and we appreciate everyone who supports the podcast patreon.com slash 372 pages here is the fanfic it could all be real it could all be fanfic or it could be a combination of the two number one and so obviously these are this is the first of two episodes we're doing of this so there could be spoilers in this that are you know because it's all from the, the rest of the book yes I knew I had to get to the police station as soon as possible. I grabbed my keys and hugged Murphy tightly to let him know that everything was going to be all right and that I would be right back. I ran to my car, put on my seatbelt, adjusted my seat, checked the mirrors, and started the engine. I drove as fast as I could, while of course obeying all traffic and safety laws. <laughs> Though Sunflower, Texas is a small town, exceeding the speed limit or running through a stop sign could cause a very serious accident. It was almost 5 p.m. when I entered the police station lobby. To my surprise... There was Mrs. Lorraine Reynolds, locked in a steamy hot kiss with Sheriff Ken Grayson. Her fingers were running through his thick curly black hair, while his hands were running delicately across the back of Lorraine's fur coat. As the door closed with a thud behind me, the sheriff shot me a glance from the corner of his eye. He immediately stepped back, releasing his hold of Lorraine. This is hot sheriff. Yes, the, uh, we've not met either of these characters yet, but they are, they are coming. I believe he has a delicious smile <laughs> coming up. Um, I don't know. The the weird thing about buckling the thing I, makes me think it's fanfic. <laughs> okay. Um, number two. Who has an answering machine these days? I guess 80-year-old men who don't change their ways very often. Uncle Kid was right behind me as I punched the button on the answering machine to listen to the messages. There were two messages. The first, Hey, Ed. Hope you remember, you're supposed to be at the bookstore at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, ready to be Santa. Oh, and also, I've got your paycheck for your Santa time last week. Obviously, someone left this message before Ed's death. That's it. That's it. Um, uh, so wait, Uncle Kid is like solving the crime? She's going to his house? <laughs> I He's mean, you know, the, the he, two of them? He's the enforcer, and the, maybe. And the dog, the... and. Well, shit, what I'd do is listen to his answering machine. <laughs> Who has an answer? I don't know. I'll say real. Whatever. Okay. Yeah, I don't think Murphy is uh, telepathic or has any real powers here. I think he's just along for the uh, for the pet. He's cute. I looked them up, by the way. They're, uh, unlike St. Bernard's, they're hypoallergenic and they don't drool. Oh, wow. And the site that I was on spelled drool, D-R-U-E-L. And since they were selling them for $2,000, wow. I did want to talk to them about that. <laughs> wow. All right, number three. 
The conversation turned to rehashing the good stuff about the party and all the plans we have for the start of the year. Marisol mm -hmm. said, We're fully booked for our first event, the scrapbooking retreat. Our guest speaker will be a history professor from Southwestern University to talk about the history of scrapbooking. And Quinn Rossi has plans for a full weekend of scrapbooking fun. Aunt Lucy said, that sounds like fun. I bet if we brought some CBD gummies, it would spark up the event. We all laughed and suggested that maybe they should keep the gummies at their shop. Oh, she twirled around and her broomstick skirt. Um... I don't know. That's fanfic. That's a bridge too far. <laughs> Gummies. Number four. I asked, why were you wearing the fur coat to the party? This is Texas, not the North Pole. Lorraine's bottom lip quivered. To hide the drugs that Judge Ed was selling me. I knew that was strange. It all made sense now. She burst into tears. I didn't mean to kill him. He was going to tell my husband about the drugs if I didn't pay him more money. He tried to grab my coat, so I pushed him back. He slipped and hit his head. And that's when you staged the crime scene to make it look like he slipped while he was getting dressed, Simon questioned. Lorraine nodded, her red hair bobbing. Wow, so, okay, so there is a Lorraine. See, this is where it gets, where it gets weird. Um, Judge was... <laughs> Selling drugs to Lorraine, who was making out with the hot sheriff with a delicious <laughs> smile and the curly hair. But that was a misdirect because she kissed him, I bet. But anyway, I don't know. I'm going to say fanfic. Okay. And here's the last one. We drove into town to go to the toy store. Carmen loves her dolls, and we wanted to get her a special doll with some doll clothes. As we walked down the street, we saw Tommy Lampkin's red truck going down the street. Both of us stopped and couldn't believe our eyes. We burst out laughing so hard that we were holding our sides and cackling. The spontaneous response was not appropriate for ladies, but could not be helped. In the front seat sat two deer. Not real deer, but the drivers had on full 3D deer heads with antlers and brown t-shirts. They looked like real deer driving the truck. <laughs> <laughs> your I mean, laughter is appropriate I, just so i was cackling sorry about that that's so odd <laughs> i don't know see this is where it gets tough like someone points that out because of how weird it is then if i say it's real then everyone's like you were fooled by that stupid crap <laughs> i'm gonna say it's real wow all right well so, yeah, this is a short book, so you have a chance to have your, your potentially best or worst like performance <laughs> hinging on like two questions. Probably. Yeah, exactly. Here we go. Um, first one was driving but making sure to obey the speed limit, mm -hmm. and then the sheriff and a steamy kiss with uh, Lorraine. You said fanfic for that, and that was fanfic, written by Bart. Okay. Bart! Off to a good start. I'm sure he's never heard that before. Interesting. <laughs> I'm uh, sure never. Number two, uh, this is the answering machine, Uncle Kid, uh, hearing a message about the bookstore uh, and Santa. You said real for that, and that was real, submitted by Harrison. Uh, two for two. Number three was the CBD gummies spicing up the weekend of scrapbooking fun. You said fanfic for that. That is real God, from later in the book. Come on. Uh, submitted by John. That's pretty delightful. <laughs> Shoot. Well, this is where I go off the rails. I'm going to go two for five, aren't I? Uh, CBD gummy spicing it up by making everyone sit around and being like, do you feel anything? No, I think these are... Where did you get these? These are... Should I eat the other half? <laughs> uh, two for three. Number four was, uh, why are you wearing your fur coat to the party? She was buying drugs from the sheriff. You said fanfic for that. That was fanfic. Written by Josh. Um, three for okay. four. Yeah, that was a little bridge, probably a bridge too far. But who knows? In this who knows? Story. That's the thing. <laughs> uh, and number five was driving into town and then seeing the most hilarious sight anyone has ever seen, holding your sides and cackling because two men wearing 3D deer heads were driving Tommy Lampkin's red truck. You, <laughs> you said real for that. Uh, that was real. Submitted by Craig. So four for five. That's uh, 80%, 80 for one book. That's a B. That's never happened before. That's a solid B. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh. Okay, I'm done. That's you know, it's such a relief. 
Yeah, I don't have like to do it next time. Winning one of those one-game uh, MLB wildcard playoffs or something. <laughs> well done. Thanks to everyone who submitted. Yeah, thank uh, you. It must be fun to write the cozy stuff. That was good stuff. Let's move on to Chapter 4. Chapter 4. Boy, oh boy. Let's see. When is my first note on Chapter 4? Because it's very funny. Mine is... Um, uh, People start to arrive at exactly six o'clock, and yes. she, she, my, I joked about it in the previous chapter, but she says, uh, "The warm, inviting aroma of cinnamon spice and evergreens filled the air, while the pianist played all the classic Christmas carols, uh, classic eighties <laughs> Christmas, Christmas carols on the baby grand piano." Several people gathered around to sing Jingle Bells, creating a festive and cozy atmosphere. So I'm like, just say it right there. Like <laughs> you can't dispute it's cozy if someone says it is. We just, uh, we mentioned it in a, it always struck me when I went to see, for some reason, I saw the perfect storm in the theater. Uh-huh. Maybe because it was, it's that German direct, he did Das Boot. So I'm like, I don't know, maybe. I saw it in the theater too. I yeah. So I went to the theater and in the middle of the movie, well, like in the first end of the first act, one of the characters, he's a famous actor. He goes like, there's a storm coming from the East Coast, and then there are winds pushing it down from the north, and then coming up from the south of the, the rain. And this could be the perfect storm. <laughs> it's like, yes, say the title of your movie in the movie, like to set up the whole thing. That's what you have to do. And this is it creating a festive and cozy atmosphere. <laughs> Thank you. It's the, Someone has to just say it. Leonardo DiCaprio pointing at the TV when they uh, when a cozy book says it's cozy. <laughs> uh, so then she describes the the people and what they're wearing, and this is my favorite thing. Um, even Simon was dressed to kill in his white crisp gu- Guyabera shirt. Guyabera. I Guyabera. I don't know. Okay, those are those two. I think that kid wears them in uh, Modern Family, the little or the uh, uh, the, the Santa in Santa's uh, summer home wears that. Type of thing. Yes, it's exactly. an old guy it's, kind of shirt. Yeah, the guy the, who gives Jerry the pen in Seinfeld was wearing one of those. Yes, but even Simon, <laughs> I like. I, yeah, like well, if I know Simon, he's yeah. going to come down in his cut off jeans and no shirt. Oh, he's wearing <laughs> his Christmas. Wow, even Simon. Even Simon, Simon's Whoa. the one character who we knew had a respectable job. He was yes. a, a professor at a He wasn't university. running an herb shop and eating yeah. CBD gummies. This Wearing guy was big like... Johnson t-shirts and, you know, <laughs> going to the monster truck rally. Yeah. Even Simon. So even Simon, Simon. The character's like, hey, hey, what? Even me? What do you mean? I'm the only one who dresses up ever yeah. around this hacienda. God. Looks like you clean up well, Longshanks. <laughs> Hey, Simon, I see you're wearing your Christmas Guayabara shirt. (laughs) (laughs) And then, I mean, this is all unnecessary and not super uh, funny, but I'm just going to read to you some of the uh, just explosion of description she throws at the reader now of the Hacienda. Sure. Terrazzo tiled floors led into the entrance with three sets of heavy windows, double window pan double doors opening to the interior of the hacienda on our left was the gathering room glistening with twinkling lights from the huge natural deer horn chandelier and smaller wall sconces the dark oak floors were cranberry and gold carpets carefully placed in front of large leather couches facing the fireplace and christmas tree invited our guests to come and enjoy there was a very large wooden table blah 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 it's a lengthy lengthy paragraph terrazzo tile floors are mentioned multiple times it's, uh, I guess that's supposed to make it cozy and put you in there, but it just comes as a, uh, you know, sort of like shouting through a megaphone at the reader. It's one of those things where it's like, do I really have to do the heavy lifting here of like my mental image? That's why I think like less is more when you just go, it was a, a Hacienda, a regular kind of Hacienda sure. entrance. We it all was spacious and, you know, like, okay, I got, I think I got it. I don't, yeah. you don't need to. This is always my complaint with Tolkien. <laughs> then they came over the top of the hill. The uh, the, the cliff fell off with trees on the top, headed to a little flat area where the, it's like, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> You're just in the woods somewhere. I, I don't need to. I can't picture this. Sure. Uh, this is what this is. Like blue tile down the hall. Sunflowers accented the terracotta walls, but there were sconces. There was a large wooden table. There's. I've got to what? Google what terrazzo tile is. Like, <laughs> stop this. Ugh. 
Just let me set my own scene. Stop. <laughs> so it's either uh, you say a variety of 80s dance moves and we rake you over the coals for not being specific about that, or you give us too much information and we want you to just exactly. say it was a hostage. Yes. you got to hit the sweet spot for us, you authors out there. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a difference between setting a yes, scene with right. minimal words and saying something really stupid like variety of 80s right. yeah. dance moves. Uh, the robot, the Roger Rabbit, the running man. He did all the 80s dance moves. <laughs> Moving on. Okay. Uh, uh, so people start to show up and they, you know, everyone else is there, even Mikkel and Douglas. Uh, Paul Turner shows up, the uh, Brad Turner. Wesley. Even Paul Turner, it says. Uh, so that's who she, she greets them all. And then uh, they introduce more people and it was hilarious because all the people she introduced sounds like they could have their own cozy spinoff series. A collection of people from the community, Charles Deaver, who owns yes. the, wood, the woodworking shop, Dan Stevens and his wife, who owned the stained glass shop, Dr. Garrett and Melva Brooks, who owned the bookstore, arrived together. So they're all, you know, they're all probably solving their own mysteries with their own telepathic cat to some degree here. Stained glass shop, woodworking shop and bookstore. It's like uh, it's it's busy town, or uh, you, know, <laughs> or you see them all doing their little thing. If you look, lonely over. worm rolled up in his, <laughs> yes. in his apple car. Uh, this was a surprise to me. I don't know if this was mentioned. I didn't look it up. Everyone's natural tendency is to pet Murphy, and his therapy dog training is perfect for this kind of setting. <laughs> Murphy's a therapy dog <laughs> to yeah. to yeah. her. Is it because of the trauma of her husband being scissored in half by a, a backhoe? I'm assuming I, that's what the accident was. That could be, yeah. I mean, I didn't think about that. I thought it was just sort of something she did as a, you know, another heart of gold moment is that she goes to oh, you know, the BFW the and sits yeah. down type of thing. Yeah, she But yeah, that's her. like lengthy, uh, expensive training for a dog. Yeah. Um, so is he wearing the little coat, right? Don't you have to have the little thing yeah, to signify? And, like, please don't pet me. I'm a therapy, therapy dog. dogs usually, yeah, say, please don't pet me. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, maybe the therapy dog training will be his version of um, psychic powers that he uses to pinpoint the killer later in the book. Sure, sure. Okay, so I didn't realize when you were reading the real or fanfic, Lorraine. Yes. Is, is a character. I forgot about that. And Pastor Mark Reed, <laughs> Dr. Garrett, so, yeah. Melva Brooks, Lorraine, Pastor Mark Reed, Paul Turner, Charles Stever, Dan Stevens, his wife. My God. Oh, my God. Well, let's highlight these two because they are important. Lorraine Reynolds is a woman that she's not familiar with. She has bright red hair, and she said her husband was out of town. And uh, she's wearing a big fur coat, which she explicitly says seems odd for the Texas weather. Yeah, it does. Uh, and then Pastor Mark Reed, <laughs> whom Simon was acquainted with, came in next. And then he and Simon go out and uh, start talking, you know, football outside. But that's his defining characteristic is that he's acquainted with Simon. Is, um, is that correct? I never know the um, whom or who. Oh, pa don't. Yeah. Pastor Mark Reed, whom Simon was acquainted with. <laughs> There's some easy way to figure out whether it's who or whom, and I can't remember what it is, so it's not very easy, I guess. But uh, anyway, I don't throw know. in a whomst if you're not, uh, if you're not <laughs> yes. certain. Really make it stand out. Uh, and then Murphy, I liked this. He was stretched out with his head in Carmen's lap, watching the revelers disinterestedly. Some might say non-caringly. Non-caringly, perhaps. <laughs> uh, I watched the waiters serving small hors d'oeuvres of cheese and spicy meats on crackers and a line of people filling their glasses with eggnog. Nothing She's got a with... weird way of putting things. <laughs> but, like, I know what hors d'oeuvres are. Hors d'oeuvres of cheese and spicy meats on crackers. Oh. Okay, All right. keep going. Tell me what an order is. Yeah. And yeah, nothing pairs with that on a uh, on a 75-degree day like the eggnog. The people are lining up to guzzle down. You just uh, Uncle Kid comes in with a, uh, he's got a, you know, a tall whiskey and uh, looking at people with their eggnog and going, what the hell is wrong with you people? <laughs> I, I wouldn't piss on eggnog. you if you were on fire. <laughs> Have you ever made eggnog before from scratch? Oh sure, sure. It's uh, I mean it's it's hard to overcome. You know, you, all you do is you you take the eggs and you you beat them, um, really, they, or the whites maybe until they're until they're 
completely foamed and then you just start pouring the rum in like it's remarkably unappealing it doesn't need to exist in the in the 21st century here's a thing that again i've i've told stories out of school that don't uh paint me in a good picture but we had chickens and they would lay a lot of eggs and you have to do stuff with eggs so we often would just go like I don't know, make some egg, some non-alcoholic eggnog. This is when I was like in junior high and high school. So there would always be a giant pitcher of eggnog. In the our, summer? In our refrigerator. <laughs> you know, when you're young and you're like, I was, I'm wrestling and everything. And like pour a big glass of like <laughs> 3,000 calorie eggnog. Oh my God. Drink it. Wow. I mean, not, at, probably not in the summer. Well, I don't think we did it in the summer. Sure. Yeah, That's but crazy. Anyway, stuff. But there was, yeah. you'd open the refrigerator and be like, what is in that pitch? Oh, it's eggnog. <laughs> my you brother, gotta throw that away. That's my it's brother four must months have old. Made that. Yeah, so. Well, I mean, that's some, some people are like, you gotta get it while you can. It's only here for between Thanksgiving and Christmas, but uh, uh, I am, unless my, you're making your own. My son loves eggnog. What can I say? Our friend uh, Doug uh, would, would, he was the first person I saw who made it, and he, uh, he, he, he kept it aged within like a beer growler. You know, with the booze, age in it. Be like, this one's from last Christmas. Like it's like they say it gets better, and it's like, what are we doing? Like, oh. we, we have we have we have beer. We could drink that beer. Like why would we? Why would we drink the raw egg mixture that's been sitting around for a year? Oh, so it's like the uh, Bailey's, right? Because Bailey's is cream, huh. but they say it that the uh, it preserves itself, so it doesn't harm you. But that eggnog seems <laughs> all right. Eggnog challenge for the listeners. Make some yes. eggnog today. Drink it again on Age it. Uh, yeah. December 13th next year and report back to us. And then, you know, we lose half our subscribers. <laughs> See our numbers <laughs> no, drop we are off. Not Whoops, responsible. We should not yes. have advised you Do to not, yeah. age eggnog. Uh, she starts laying it on really thick in terms of like how cozy it all is, how happy everyone is. As I looked around the room, I saw small groups of people talking and laughing, and I couldn't help but feel hopeful. Maybe Sunflower Farms had a bright future ahead. It doesn't immediately cut to the death then, but like it, you know, it, she she sees the kids uh, decorating cookies and laughing. What a great way to get into the Christmas spirit! So get to the corpse, boy. Oh boy, I sure am happy, and things sure are going well. <laughs> I left the cookie decorating merriment to go check on the caterers. Just then, Janet Crosby hands in the air. So again, the uh, <laughs> wow, yeah, tube man, tube man. Came running from the hallway. Do you remember where that was and what kind of tiles were in the hallway? Oh, my God. Rushed into the bad. gathering room and screamed, I think Santa is dead! <laughs> was she still waving her hands as she said that? Like, <laughs> yes. <you> know... <laughs> oh. oh, Janet Crosby did that. Uh, listener, I did not notice it because there's so many characters, but listener Jeffrey pointed out that this is the... First and only mention of Janet Crosby in the book. <laughs> the full name. Nothing I like that. Uh, uh, the delivery name. key information. We don't know what uh, what she works at, whether it's uh, she makes runs an ornament shop or, you know, makes has a shop that just sells candy canes downtown type of thing. But that's, maybe she gets a spinoff in the next one. Oh, that was so good. It's. I, I like that we've you know sort of tampered in God's domain here by sending all these people to buy this book from this relatively new author. Uh, we've probably ensured that this series is now, uh, you know, twenty-seven volumes by Christmas time next year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here's the crime scene in this. I don't know. There's something in this that made me laugh. I'm sorry. <laughs> when I looked in, there was Judge Ed with his Santa pants on. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for pointing out that his pants were on i appreciate that and his sock feet i guess I think that's like thing. you know compression old guy you know black sure. socks like i'm not dead yet oh yes you are <laughs> at the end of my bed with a puddle of blood forming behind his head i'm no doctor or crime detective but i know from what i've seen on tv crime shows that you shouldn't disturb the crime scene so I said in my most authoritative voice, don't touch anything, everyone out. <laughs> There's just a lot to unpack there. Yeah, I mean, so his only his Santa pants are on, so I'm just imagining his, you know, yellowed wife beater, potentially some sort of like back brace, gut poking out through it, like a bad Santa kind of thing with the pool of blood forming behind his head. <laughs> I, I found it quite funny as well. And then oh. this is funny too, because this is a... 
this is the type of thing that only happens in TV shows. You can tell exactly what she's seen and just replicating on the page. Dr. Garrett came through the door of the bedroom and kneeled beside me. He touched Judge Ed's neck for a pulse and then shook his head. So that's he, he does the – and then looks up. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the guys who you know do the uh, – like they they find the uh, material of the crime scene and they they dab their fingers in it and just like rub it between their fingers to try to figure out what it is. Like no one has ever done this. Like they slice clearly... open the bag and lick the edge of the knife and then they go, yeah, uh, pure. <laughs> it's, it's pure. It's pure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, th- I think the doctor might have something to say. Like you know, are you <laughs> trying to like establish you know whether he's lucid? Like you know, talk to me, Ed. Like uh, yes, uh, but nope, uh, no, just, just purses his lips and shakes his head and gets up and leaves. And then this happens again. What is the deal with this? Another book goes second person. Oh, okay. Which is very, like, again, second person is extremely rare and hard to pull <laughs> off and shouldn't be attempted. But this, uh, the end of the chapter says, I suppose when you kill Santa, that puts a damper on your party. Okay. We just want my party? When you, you kill killed Santa? Sound- I didn't kill Santa. When I suppose when you kill Santa, that puts a damper on your party. Ah, I uh, <sighs> unforced error. I mean, I, I I felt figured that was sort of funny. Like, but uh, yeah, the the change of tense makes it very it's confusing. Just, it's very strange when someone does that, or a confession. Yeah, you killed Santa. Okay, just greased up the floor, knowing he'd slip on it with his support hose. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, well, that's, she pretty much says, um, the pianist had stopped playing. I asked everybody, please hang around for a while until Sheriff Grayson arrives. He'll know what to do. End of chapter. And I'm assuming, like, we're supposed to imagine, like, the record scratch almost in, you know, real time. Like, yeah. someone killed Santa. <laughs> like, jingle bell, jingle bell. <laughs> what? The and, dog's like, monocle bell. <laughs> <laughs> Monocles dropping into uh, martini glasses. Ooh. Yeah, the, the fur coat lady. Yes, definitely. Uh, I've never uh, heard of such a thing. <laughs> Santa being killed at a party that I am attending. Rarity dog. <laughs> um. Well, so the uh, next chapter starts as everyone like the the ambulance is coming, and she describes Judge Ed further, which to me was also very funny. As I looked, as I looked. I could see Judge Ed sprawled on the floor, and there was blood and hair on the bedpost. He had Santa pants on with an undershirt and one boot part- partially on. I could see some crusted eggnog <laughs> in his beard. He looked like he was getting ready to deliver presents to all the good little boys and girls. He hopefully had a few more steps before he was going to do that. He hopefully was going <laughs> to sponge some of that out of his beard and maybe put on a shirt. <laughs> He was looked like he was ready. I love how this guy gets treated in posthumously, <laughs> like ah, I've got a pool of blood growing around his head, and then like his crusty beard, crusted with eggnog, <laughs> yeah. no shirt on, yeah. <laughs> He's, stink lines coming out of his armpits. I'm a judge, but for some reason I have to work as Santa on the weekends. For some reason, <laughs> I'm not doing too well, man. <laughs> and then we get this, which you referenced earlier. Ellis Ann, Judge Ed was agent. He was about 82 years old. <laughs> he made it very clear he was 82. <laughs> so that's a uh, another another trope of our, our authors. Needlessly ambiguous specificity. Did something nefarious happen? Did Santa get into a tussle? <laughs> tussle? A dust up? Uh, <laughs> you call that a tussle when he's lying there in a pool of his own blood, caked real... with eggnog on his beard? <laughs> Must have been a Donnybrook. Oh, that they really got some fisticuffs going in here. Um, and then the sheriff shows up, and this is you know hallmark moment number five, probably Sheriff Ken Grayson. Uh, who she had previously not met somehow. Uh, wow, he is cute. Dark, wavy hair, broad shoulders, mm. sultry eyes, steamy, hot. Wait, uh, I can't be thinking like this. Santa is lying here dead. This is not the time or place. So wow. hot law enforcement is also the, uh, that's usually the blue collar guy that our, uh, you know, fashion line CEO falls in love with when she moves back home, right? 
it's him yeah, or just a, yeah. you know a construction guy or something yeah he you know drives up in his uh, f-150 and looks like you got stuck in the ditch <laughs> oh my <laughs> Sorry, I, I've never changed one of these before. I really should have learned. Yeah, I went, I was trying to be a musician, and then I went to Nashville, but I moved back home to the Hacienda. Oh, oh. I take care of rescue dogs, and I visit the uh, children. At, oh. And he's driving her. You know, one time, uh, me and Johnny, Johnny Cash. Uh, oh, God, God damn, damn it. son of a. Uh, but the- she says this is a, a weird thing. These so and we all know how and works, right? Sure. Finally, the sheriff came through the bedroom door. I had not previously met him, and he introduced himself as Sheriff Ken Grayson. <laughs> what is that sentence construction? <laughs> I hadn't noticed that. And so those two things happened. I had so, not previously yeah. met him, and he introduced himself. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, guess it I works, hate, but yeah, it's so he so to, he introduced himself. I hate to nitpick. I, it's just no, you're funny. a writer. You're supposed Start to be to a writer. Them. <laughs> but the judge has no judge has something going on here. It's very bizarre. He because the the doctor has already done the pulse on the neck and shakes his head solemnly. But uh, judge, uh, uh, sorry, the sheriff looked over the scene and without further ado stated, "This looks like an accident." Judge Ed was old after all, and seniors tend to fall a lot. No foul play here. I'm pretty sure Ed lost his balance. Plus, I can tell he's had quite a bit to drink. I guess that's from all the eggnog crusted in his beard. Is is eggnog the thing you <laughs> again? <laughs> you want to really get a bender going because you <laughs> have to put up with his little brat, so you like slam the eggnog. I mean, I you know you probably put on a Santa suit to entertain youngsters. It's you know you probably. Want to have a few to, to just, you know, just, make it a little more tolerable? Just throw a flask in your <laughs> coat pocket. I don't think you need to start slamming the people's eggnog yeah. at the place. How God, crusty I, I, was the beard? I hope they have some eggnog there because I got to tie one on before yeah. this. I think the more logical reaction would be like, is that in his beard eggnog? My God. I'm in shirts and t shirt and shorts. It's so hot. Iced tea. Look, Uncle Kid doesn't even have any pants on at all. He's wearing a Speedo. Um, Sonic challenge for you. Okay. Uh, this is... Um, do we know her name yet? That's our no, narrator. Not okay, been, yeah. all right. So I assume this is our narrator who thinks that the um, sheriff is hot. She should settle down. She says, excuse me, you have another... Oh, I have to read it flatly because the description comes at the end. Excuse me, you have another appointment. <laughs> what? Like another Christmas party? I realized I was almost shouting at him. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, all right. I've already shouted something. Almost uh, shouted. I've shouted ho, 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 and then chuckled. Yeah. Almost shouting. Excuse me, you have another appointment? What, like another Christmas party? That's almost shouting. Like it's you're you're. I was repressing shouting, and it start. It came out really stilted and weird. Hang on, I'll be the I'll be the sheriff. Excuse me, are you almost shouting at me, little lady? I am almost shout. As a matter of fact, yes. Oh, that's him. Another Christmas mm. party. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. I'm just so distracted by how attractive you are that I'm almost shouting. <laughs> His behavior infuriated me. Again, who's me? No amount of cute scare quotes could excuse <laughs> that. He's an egotistical, self-serving, uncompassionate jerk. All caps. All caps. So he. So now we're in the present time. Anyway, the tense is changing. I don't know. <laughs> uh, about as much anger as you ever get in a cozy, though, I'd say. Yeah. I mean, how often have we seen that where the meat cute is people being sort of angry at each other, not mm-hmm. liking each other the first time they meet one another? <laughs> Why, you're a jerk. I can't believe our leashes got intertwined. Your dog is acting crazy. My dog? Your dog is the one. I don't like you at all. You spilled coffee on my sweater. We should really have this argument away from the corpse that we're standing on top of, though. That yeah, the pool of blood is not, spreading, yeah, and it's starting either. to get yeah. on my shoe, which he is has voided into the shoe. Santa pants. It's, uh... <laughs> I could see the spreading. 
He looks like Santa in Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny. There's actual <laughs> feces caked Marks. on his drawers. Oh. Oh. All right. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, she goes and tells everybody that um, the, the, the Santa is dead, Judge Ed Simpson is dead, and that it's been ruled an accident, and pretty much tells everybody to go home. They load The coroner loads them onto the corpse, and uh, that uh, Simon says, like, a lot of our guests said they had seen Egg drink several cups of eggnog, so maybe he was a little tipsy. So they're just like... What were they going in the back room and looking at Ed for? Or was he wandering around the party? Uh, he was out there, and then he went back to change into oh. the suit. He was like just... He was oh, socializing. he was just being a judge. Yeah, yeah. He was just okay. hanging out, and then he was going to go and, I guess, surprise everybody. He's like, I go back to... What's the chick's name who's... Oh, we don't know that yet? Okay, I gotta go back because I gotta replace all of her under things and then get yeah, my, put it back. My, my pants on. Do I have I got anything my... in my beard? Yeah, you have quite a bit. Well, I'll take care of it in a minute. That I'll wipe it out with one of her bras. That <laughs> should be fine. Uh, but then to end the chapter, Uncle Kid... Oh, hell yeah. ...brings the cozy. Texas wisdom. Uncle Kid started to leave and then said... It doesn't take a genius to spot a goat and a flock of sheep. <laughs> so maybe a little shut eye will open our eyes to see what's in front of us. And on that note, I'll see you manana. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Kid. <laughs> Uncle Kid of rules. Yes, especially oh. knowing that he is Sam Elliott. I, he hasn't really been talking like that the whole way. but no, you know, All of a sudden he steps into the, a crime scene. Like He's been at the Hacienda his whole life. But somehow is like the wisest, like, <laughs> right. well, it don't take nothing to see that. Uh, like, you lived in that little corner room over there for 65 years. Yeah. You You've got it. no life wisdom at all. Yeah. <laughs> You're one of those guys who's like, I don't like what I heard about what's going on down in the big city. So <laughs> going to a, a Cowboys game, that seems like a good way to get carjacked. I'm not going to be going down there. I don't, uh, you know that those uh, chemtrails you're saying. All right, Uncle Kid, <laughs> come on, man. It don't take a genius to spot a goat in a fluoridated water. That's why I drink only from the will. <laughs> oh, all right, so that's the end of uh, Chapter 5. That, that one I'll give her credit for. That's how you end a chapter. Yeah. Uncle, Uncle Kid walks out of the room, spits in the spittoon, and it circles around the edge and drops down and says, yeah. I'll see you manana. Yeah. That's, that's cold a good, blooded chapter yeah, endings or what I prefer. Good, good, yes. <laughs> but uh, chapter six uh, begins with her thinking she can't sleep because she thinks something's amiss. She's wondering, uh, did Ed have the wrong boot on the wrong foot or was that only my imagination? Ooh, and, yeah. uh, so there's like a little details that were not mentioned in the, in the, in the moment, but she's, she's hung up on them. And then in the morning when she opens up her windows, uh, which have, drapes on them not cardboard that she's hung up on like your house in san diego yeah, right. uh she realized that her diamond stud earrings that my father had given me and my watch were not on my nightstand no word on who has given her the watch or anything like that so she thinks that uh she's been robbed in addition to the judge dying in her bedroom yes and i will point out that uh okay exclamation points are kind of they've dropped off but we are starting uh, fragmentary sentences are now occurring Oh, nice. A cup of coffee for me and some food for Murphy, then off to the sheriff's office. <laughs> okay. There hasn't been any before then, but now we're just starting with these. Getting so into the terse uh, detective novel uh, prose. Exactly. Yeah. And here it comes. Uh, she enters the sheriff's office. Uh, no one else is there. He says, come in. And we get this. I'm Darby Grimes from the Christmas party last night where we found Judge Ed Simpson dead. That is... It's the third time Darby's mentioned. Other characters have referred to her twice, but this is the first time we understood that Darby is also the narrator who we've uh, been spending the past six chapters with. Why isn't that part of the, the title of the book? Of yeah. Darby Grimes, Sunflower Farms, Hacienda Mystery, Cozy. <laughs> what? I don't understand why you'd leave that out. Maybe she's got big plans to spread the coziness out and have different people solve the mysteries, like the uh, stained glass window shop owner maybe yeah, he gets the next be. one so yeah wow darby <laughs> the series is bigger than darby <laughs> uh this is where she, he says this is the sheriff uh yeah i remember you what can i do for you he gave me his alarmingly delicious smile <laughs> but i didn't want to be distracted from my mission 
So I just ask everyone out there. I mean, we're on video. We can try it. Could you give me your most delicious smile right to the oh, camera, God. please? Jeez, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you do it. No way. I'm too, I don't want that on record. Okay. Uh, smile challenges. Uh, the sheriff's sticking with his uh, with his theory, though. He just says several people said he had a lot to drink, and drunks often do questionable things. So he's, he's old. He's drunk. <laughs> he's stumbling all over. What else do you want from me? The guy hit his head. Yeah, and it, that's provoked by her saying she points at the photo and says, "No, it's correct. His boot was on the wrong foot. Why would why would he stand to put his boot on some nonsense? It's yeah. hard to understand." But he also just chalks that up to being drunk. And then, but the 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 counter to that, which is pretty funny, the eggnog was spiked, but not heavily. <laughs> I think I, he would have had to have drunk a gallon to have been really drunk. That's even worse. You're like being like, I'm drinking, I've had three cups of eggnog and I'm not even like, it's like light beer. What the hell is wrong with you? I'm here for one reason, putting this thing away. He's bringing one of those, like, uh, you know, the, the things you brew beer in, he's bringing that over to the eggnog thing and like spooning it in, going into the back room. And I'm just like, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Um, Sonic challenge for you. All right. This one's tough. Oh, we we both have They've to do all this. Been tough. Okay. We both have to do this. Oh, okay, great. Yep. Both she, ants chime she's left, in. She's left the police station irritated. Yes. And she's returned back to uh, discuss with everyone about what happened last night. Yes. She. Uh, yes. She's irritated. He's so cute, but he won't listen to. He, he won't hear anything. Yeah. Um, both. So she comes back and expresses her frustration. And here's the Sonic challenge. Do you have it there? Both ants yep. chimed in at the same time. Yes, in response to, I'm not convinced that Ed's death was an accident. Okay, okay here we go. Neither, Neither are we, we but, but we don't, don't know how else to explain, explain what, what happened. happened. We need to review, <laughs> to review this, this list, list of, of people, people who were, who were here, here for the party, party as, as if they, they were suspects, suspects of, of a murder. murder. We, we can, can eliminate, eliminate those that, that we are sure that, that they, they were, were not involved. involved. And she just looks at her aunts and wearing their skirts and stuff like, I got to get me some of those gummies. And, <laughs> yeah. and then it says immediately some people were ruled out because they arrived after the time of De- Ed's death. <laughs> and so th- th- what did those people do whilst they were there? Just being like, oh, yeah, that's a shame. Like, give me the booze while I'm here. I didn't drive all the way out here to not <laughs> give me some of those spicy sausages on crackers. Yeah. Is that a cracker topped with something? <laughs> what do they call those? If only there were a name. Oh, well, um, I, w- I want to um, I want to read you something and then you react to it like a normal human human would. But I'm okay. just going to keep going because this is how it goes. Uncle Kid said, "I saw Mrs. Reynolds talking, or should I say, flirting with the bartender just before the time, and then I saw her get that big fur coat of hers, and she left out the front door." Okay, um, that's that sounds. Why does anyone need a big fur coat in Texas when it's seventy degrees outside? Well, I mean, it's an important question, but however, don't I don't recall to... seeing Pastor Reed. Well, we weren't talking about him. Let's just go back to Mrs. Wright. Possibly he had already left. Well, well, who cares though? And that Mrs. was her plan. Who plan? What to are we talking? To leave separately so no one would figure out their little meet up later. Okay, do you know anything? Do you said we I heard that Pastor Reed would take up with any hound that would hunt. We well, all that's... snickered a little. Okay, I wasn't going to snicker. I was going to be like, why did you bury the lead here and <laughs> save the fact that they may be uh, getting busy for the end of your sentence, your, your, of your monologue? Uh, Uncle uh, Kid said all of that? <laughs> any, hound, any hound that would hunt. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's so he's, what I heard. Aunt Lindy, I mean, so 
they're, you know, they're trying to solve a murder. They're, they're going through their own recollections here, their eyewitness recollections, those things that are notoriously holed up in court and are, are yeah, reliable. His, his blood, by the way, is drying on her bedroom floor, right? <laughs> yes, they're never getting it out. Uh, but they're, they're trying to see, like, who was there and all this stuff. But Aunt Lindy has an impish grin on her face and said, I heard some gossip that Pastor Reed has been seeing a lot of Miss Lorraine Reynolds. So implying that they're banging. The affair from the A Killer Christmas Affair, I will admit, and it is my great shame, that that did not occur to me until this morning when I was reviewing um, notes for this. Wait, what didn't occur to you? The Killer Christmas Affair. Oh, an affair. Yes, yeah. I thought the affair was that someone was killed. Yeah, I, I, so I, I, realized I was like, that... oh, well, they're setting this up as being a, an affair. Um, By the but... way, I, I will do an impish grin since you did a delicious smile. Oh, thank you. So I'll do an impish grin. Oh, my God. Also <laughs> bad. Also bad. <laughs> not good. No, it's not good at all. Oh, this is uh, going to ruin us. This uh, we're thing. doomed. We're doomed. <laughs> uh, so they go on to describe, uh, Aunt Lindy says, I don't know if she's still grinning impishly. Um, oh, he's a hound dog, all right. Uh, but I really can't see him physically hurting anyone. However, consider what would happen if someone found out Pastor Reed was having an affair. He's a married man. <laughs> he, <laughs> he'd lose his job. And probably the church would end his ordination. He'd lose his wife, his reputation, and Lorraine, Lorraine Reynolds' marriage would be at stake. Plus, she would be ashamed of her behavior. All bad news, but what purpose would killing Ed serve? It makes little sense. Yeah, unless you've seen Lorraine's hubahonga, so. <laughs> Woo! But I said, you're right. Again, people talk in extraordinary length with other people just sitting there, like hanging also on the words. Also, like, Are are you done? Should I keep? <laughs> You're right, but we can't eliminate anyone. You just eliminated a bunch of people. Several That's people. That's exactly who... what you're there to do. <laughs> uh, so uh, that that confused me. But now that we know who I said means, it's good. I can relax good. a yes, little bit. It is like, Darby. Oof, Darby. Okay, that's the I. They go to uh, discuss Paul Turner, the developer, um, and they describe him as a slimy devil. He was drinking one cup of eggnog after another. He came up to the table, and I caught him double dipping his cup in the punch bowl. I shouldn't, I couldn't believe it. And he looked at me and grinned sheepishly. I gave him that "you should be ashamed of yourself" look. Uh, so that's how uh, that, that's how low this how low of a snake this guy is. Is he He's double a dips? Slimy his... devil. So Aunt Lucy laughed sarcastically. Yeah, uh, I'll give you. I'll give you that one. You do that, please. <laughs> uh, and then um, look at me and grin sheepishly. So we have an impish grin. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that one we can survive. That one. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Paul Turner, the slimy devil, was schmoozing with the councilmen. So the the council this is Uncle Kid. Yeah. Yeah. Paul Turner was schmoozing with the councilmen. He talks 10 words a second with Gus to 50. <laughs> Legitimately, uh, my favorite character. He rules. Uncle Kid is, is awesome. But yeah. so the councilmen are like, um, we just saw you double dip your cup. You are a slimy devil. <laughs> you are not getting that uh, yeah. whatever, that that's land lease or whatever. About. Like, God, that's just revolting. Yeah. You know, now if they refrigerate it, it's going to get that weird water in it where it, like, oh, you know, on. because you double dipped. <laughs> yeah, it's a breeding ground now. God. Oh, Paul so Turner. Bad. God, you're a slimy devil. <laughs> so the four suspects that we have now are, um, I'm sorry, we left over one thing. Uh, there was something about uh, the caterer Bailey. Because Aunt Lucy remembered seeing the caterer guy Bailey coming up the hall just at that time. But I assumed he had gone to the restroom. So our suspects are Paul Turner, the slimy devil developer, mm -hmm. Pastor Reed, uh, the redhead with the fur coat, Lorraine Reynolds, and then the caterer, Bailey. Yes. And so they've gone through the list. Marisol looked at her list and shook her head in agreement. But other than that, I think the party was great, I said. And everyone laughed. <laughs> A man is dead and we're ruined. <laughs> A man with no shirt on and Santa pants died in my bedroom. It's it's all anyone will ever associate with our new motel, business, bakery, and oh, gem store. I think everything's going really well. Oh. <laughs> the piano player's like, um, 
I didn't play for the whole night, but you still owe me. That's our yes. contract. So could I get my check right now, please? <laughs> <laughs> We're still laughing over the death. Could you come back? All right. And then chapter seven is the last one that we're covering today. Um, it has some great stuff in it. Uh, really soon, great stuff. Yeah. As soon as they finished our meeting, I called Divine Catering and requested to speak with Phyllis Newton, the owner. Good afternoon, Phyllis. This is Darby Grimes from the Christmas party last night at Sunflower Hacienda. <laughs> oh, yes. Is there anything wrong? Possibly. As you know, someone found Judge Ed Simpson, the de Santa, dead in my bedroom. It's like... Possibly. Possibly. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, oh, did you have more to say? Because is that the bet? Is that the wrong thing that yeah. he was dead, or were the uh, the crackers were slightly stale? <laughs> Which is the bet? The thing that's wrong. <laughs> she immediately launches into like the legalese, like just like talk to my lawyer. Hangs up the phone. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> yeah, his head was bashed in. His blood is uh, still. We have to get one of those. Uh, you know, murder cleanup guys that come out. And... <laughs> the, the wolf. Yeah, they uh, they bring their uh, the spray and they do the blue light over it after it's done to make sure that there's no uh, bio hazards <laughs> in my bedroom. So possibly something is wrong. Fortunately, there is one of those guys in town. He has the place in between the woodworking shop and the stained glass thing. Uh, you know, Frank's murder cleanup is uh, not the coziest store, but it does a big business. Uh, and then she has this exchange with uh, what's her name? Divine Phyllis. Phyllis. Phyllis uh, Newton. Newton of divine catering full full names for uh, yes. for some people uh they start speaking like robots to each other do you have his last name address and his social security number just a minute and i'll get it for you <laughs> moments later she returned with the information his full name was bailey fox and he had given her an address i thanked her and hung up <laughs> what is happening <laughs> Back to the terseness. I don't know. Well, why? Maybe she's just so shocked at how easy it was to obtain a uh, <laughs> just, social security number from an employer that she uh, just is like, I can't believe I got away with that. Thank you for your time. Good day, ma'am. Really? You're gonna, I didn't even have to grease your palm. Like It wasn't like a, uh, <laughs> maybe this, uh, maybe pictures of dead presidents will uh, loose your tongue, Phyllis Newton. Like, yeah. what? I don't oh, even just understand. A minute. I, Here, let me get his social security number, <laughs> which is strictly forbidden by law. <laughs> Every single employee protection law. <laughs> So that wow. <laughs> she does say that Bailey was a last minute substitute for the party yes. and he didn't come to work today. So that's very suspicious. But I was wondering, like, is would this ever work? Like, how how easy would it be to do this? Like, just call up a your, any given business and ask for an employee's Social Security number. And I was like, well, that you know, probably get in trouble if you try to do that. But there is a place where information like this, Social Security numbers are known to be readily available the dark web. Yes. They're yes. just floating all around out there. All of ours yeah, are probably true. out there. Yeah. So I went on the dark web. I found someone more than willing to sell this information. And I was like, well, I mean, I don't want to just ask for, you know, any given, uh, you know, accountant in Oklahoma's information. Yeah. I was like, let me see if I can, if I can track down Mike's information. What? Yeah. Uh, well, because then you could verify it, you know, otherwise it'd be like, oh, who knows if they got a social security number right. So I went on and I was going to, like, try to track down as much as I could about you to see what's out. It, this is helpful for you. How is it'll this be, helping me? It'll be helpful to know what's floating around out there so you can, you know, you can, oh. I don't know, you can, you can change your social security number or whatever if it's out there. Like, you can oh. you can move if you need to. Is this um, is good for me? It's good, yeah. I mean, it's you could relocate to Canada if you're unable to, you know, pay your taxes here or something. Huh. Um, so okay. yeah, the dark web, they didn't really right. want to conduct a business on the, uh, you know, text or whatever weird system you use on their trillion or, but they wanted to talk on the phone on a secure connection. So I gave them a call. I recorded my end of the conversation. They were not willing oh. to let the other part be on there, but, um, yeah. So this is me calling someone I found on the dark web to try to track down your information. Oh, uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Hey, Brit, how you doing? Yeah, we're good. How's everything in Minnesota? You guys get any snow yet? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Look, look, before you get into any of that, um, what's Mike's social security number? Oh, hang on. Let me get a pen. Six, four, three. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Wait. O2 or 2O? 2O. Got it. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks. That saved me like 30 bucks in Bitcoin. Well, I've got you here, though. Do uh, you know his mother's maiden name? Awesome. Uh, what about his first pet? <laughs> That's a funny name for a guinea pig. Uh, what about his blood type? No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't go ask him. God. He's going to blow this whole thing. Uh, oh, negative. Really? Huh. Universal donor. Um, what about your son's birthdays? Wait, wait, wait. Is that your son August Nelson or your son George Nelson? Okay. And George? All righty. Uh, I mean, while I'm asking stuff, what was the last time Mike cried? Really? At Doctor Who? Okay. <laughs> Yikes. Um, I mean, well, Christmas is coming up. Any ideas what he'd like for a present? What do you mean? Who the hell cares? Okay. 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 I'm sorry I asked. Jeez. Um, hey, could you put Mike on, actually? I need to ask him something. Good. Good talking to you. Hey, Mike. None of your business. Hey, uh, we got to record the next episode. How does Wednesday work for you? Huh. You can't move it? Look, doctors say things all the time. The surgery is critical and time sensitive. That's just corporate speak. Push it back. Great. Oh, by the way, I heard there's a lot of scams going around where you get these like uh, identity theft alerts and where it looks like a bunch of money gets siphoned out of your account and into some Cayman Islands offshore thing. So uh, if anything like that happens, ignore it. Or they might actually come back and hack you for real if you try to like look into it at all. Oh, no, no. No, my pleasure. I'm happy to help, buddy. Okay, sweet. Talk to you Wednesday. Bye. Huh. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure who that was that had your information. I'm, I'm going to protect their identity. It's oh, but like you, you protect wanna, their identity? <laughs> you might want to take, uh, take some precautions because oh. stuff about there is out, you know, out there now for you. Jeez. I, I just freed that Nigerian prince. And oh, this could have been where it leaked to, yeah. Oh um, dear, yeah. Huh. I'm well, sorry, yeah. can we? Re- well, we got a, a little chapter to do. Now? Yeah, we got to keep moving. We got to do a chapter. Otherwise, I was going to hit the phones and start trying to track that. Can- yeah, it's canceling probably not stuff. that urgent. I no, think. okay. All the right. Doctor I'm Who fine. thing is pretty embarrassing. I would just uh, I would <laughs> sure. Maybe uh, we'll trust our our listeners not to leak our our yeah. faces we've made or that you cried at a doctor. Yeah, let's just say just. Put a can we put a screen around that? That's yeah. fine. People yeah. will it's a they'll agreement. honor that, right? You've, you've, yeah. you've, our terms and conditions. You've by, you sure. know, by okay. listening, you've agreed to not do anything embarrassing. Okay, all right, gotcha. <laughs> um, wow, all right. So yeah, they uh, Marisol happens to be a whiz on the computer because she was a former <laughs> reporter for Texas Living Magazine, and uh, she ran a com- ran a computer search, and within minutes, they found Bailey Fox had a criminal history of theft. <laughs> Bailey Fox, where are we getting these? <laughs> oh, getting into like Star Trek or Star Wars territory, with right? Yeah, Bailey Kit, Fox, Kit Fisto, and yes. uh, Sleez Bagano. Um, and then she says, "Do you think he was in my room trying to steal my jewelry?" And Ed interrupted or surprised him. Maybe he pushed Ed while trying to escape. I think we can assume he stole the jewelry. And this is when it occurred to me: check the. Six security cameras you had mentioned here, like, you know, that you spent the first You spent second, a long time talking about them. Uploading apps and checking, setting up notifications on them. And they do. They A few sentences later, like, oh, we should be able to check the security camera recordings. Yeah. But it's, it's a funny thing to not have thought of in the moment, uh, at, right after the murder took place and, you know, see if anyone was fleeing yes. uh, type of thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we, so she's... Bothering this, the guy with the delicious smile, um, which you gave an example of. Thank you. Sheriff that, Grayson, that was, yes. Yeah, it was very, very delicious. delicious. Uh, all of a sudden, like, we, we heard the robotic dialogue between the people, right, with Social Security numbers and all of that. 
And then all of a sudden it stops. Sheriff Grayson said he would come right over after I told him about Bailey. He was actually nice and not so gruff and egotistical. Why is the dialogue stopping? I explained about the missing jewelry and described it to Sheriff Grayson. Then I told him about the eyewitness that said they saw Bailey in the hallway. Well, I just don't understand why these vague descriptions of what you when you were just doing it. And then the dialogue starts immediately after that paragraph. Right. Well, what is the point of redacting that dialogue? Maybe just because they've already described it. it, but like that doesn't stop, that doesn't stop before. her. No. <laughs> and they they have they do have footage of him um, in her room or leaving her room, but it's uh, an hour or half an hour before Ed was there. So they show that to the sheriff, and he of course denies everything again. Like he's pretty much just like if I remember correctly, the bathrooms are right across the hall. It's like. <laughs> So he is just determined to, like, you know, doing the, uh, it's probably just a bird, run the test type of yes. thing. Yes. Uh, but then, um, so this is the first time I think that this came up. Maybe not, no, it's not the first time. The uh, asterisks that separate parts of a chapter. Yeah, yeah. So um, he's, the sheriff smiles, that gorgeous smile. <laughs> Can we see a gorgeous smile? No. You, please. Okay. <laughs> and left. He still irritated me to no end. I don't like him and his gorgeous smile. Cute's not going to get the job done for you, mister. But I can't stop thinking about him. <laughs> and then... Uh, you get four asterisks. Four asterisks and then this. That evening, the sheriff called to say he had found Bailey at the address he had given Divine Catering. A lot of things to track there. He even found the earrings... And the watch at his house. <laughs> he arrested him for stealing the jewelry. That is great. Quote, Bailey admitted to stealing the jewelry. Yeah, you just... But he <laughs> firmly states that he knew nothing of the death of Ed. He kept telling me that he's a thief but not a murderer. Look, I am a thief. I steal. I, I can't stop stealing. God, listen, listen, to me. listen to me, Bailey Fox. <laughs> If there's a crime that's happened in town that's unsolved, yeah, it was probably me, as long as it was a theft, but not a murder. I joined the catering company, and I gave them a false social security number so <laughs> I could steal this stuff, but I'm not a murderer. <laughs> and then, uh, so, he says after that, so they have this exchange, he's obviously whacking him with a, you know, a hose, you know, yeah, he's, got right, a, yeah. he's got the not car battery and the sponges, you know, hooked up to his back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he goes... Well, he told me he's a thief, but not a murderer. Looks like we're back to where we started. <laughs> Ed's death was probably just an accident. <laughs> well, that was a dead end. <laughs> the criminal who gave false information to infiltrate your house says he didn't murder him. So, right, yes. My hands are... <laughs> my hands are tied, much like Bailey's were when I was whipping his crotch with a knotted rope. <laughs> <laughs> the wicker chair with the bottom cut out of it. Ah, yes. Ah, oh, well, things are cozy. We've had multiple crimes. We've had sugar cookies. We've had a dead Santa with blood pooling and eggnog in his beard. What else can you ask for for one of these books? <sighs> it's so funny, though. The the Like, this is a cozy mystery. Couldn't be more cozy. And then all of a sudden the throat clearing, like... <clears throat> Well, it is in a warm clime, so it's actually not very cozy. So, so as far as the cozy elements, you're, you're not actually going to get those things. Yeah. But yeah. they're yeah. implied. Yeah. Will you if do... it if it gets cool in the evening, will maybe we'll have the eggnog. But you know, just don't expect it. Is what I'm saying. You do get Uncle Kid walking in, being like, "It's hotter than a crotch out there today." Oh but, man. Uh... I mean, uh, Jingle All the Way was on TV, and that one always gets me laughing with that Sinbad oh. fella. You know but, what? He and I, me and the judge, we were tighter than a bull's butt in fly season. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, he knows what I'm saying, big shooter. All right, Uncle Kid out. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I guess, you know, we, we probably need to predict who we think done it at this point in time. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, since uh, I don't have to do real or fanfic next time. And there's really only, I mean, they've explicitly said there are three suspects, so if it's not one of them... Um, well, wait a minute. The real or fanfic we had a confession was that fanfic. Uh, which one? Wasn't there uh, one where someone said yes? I oh, did yeah. It? Well, she said to hide the drugs. That was fanfic. 
Okay, that was uh, and then All him right. being so we don't know. It was her don't. smooching the sheriff was also fanfic. So okay, people okay. Were, were good about that. Okay, uh, cool. I mean, I nevertheless, <laughs> I, I I do suspect one of those two, uh, probably the pastor, as he was going to be. They've established that the stakes for him would be very high if he were if his affair, which is mentioned in the title, were found out. Therefore, I'm I'm speculating it is it is either him or the very confusingly named Lorine. Can I? Make a bold prediction. Yeah. It's both of them. Okay. It's Lorraine and the pastor. Did she do the little uh, kneel down behind him and he pushes him over him like a footstool <laughs> uh, from the playground move? <laughs> he is pretty drunk. Just push him. <laughs> Judge is like, what? Is this someone behind? What is happening here? He's so drunk that he calls her Lorraine, even though he knows her name is Lorraine. And what if he was like, he... Another prediction. The judge, because he's a respectable judge, faked the eggnog thing. Wow. So then they're like, after he's dead, they're like, quick, pour that eggnog in his beard. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, just, he's fading it with a light from his eyes. Like, no, please. I hate eggnog. My reputation. Don't, don't make me, don't make people think I liked eggnog. The uh, yeah, then they start a whisper campaign, being like, oh, "I saw the judge putting away a whole lot of eggnog out there." Anyone yes. else see that? Yeah, I saw it too. I, the judge was drinking a lot of eggnog. <laughs> Viral marketing his eggnog <laughs> consumption. Oh, you guys oh. don't know about the judge? Yeah, it's a, kind of the talk of the party, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Those terrazzo tiles are one thing; the judge's eggnog is another. Oh, I mean, All right, uh, we had some good emails. Let's read the emails uh, that we got this week. Okay. All right, here are some emails also from our beloved Patreon supporters. Uh, Patreon.com slash 372 pages. This one's from Peter. This is wild. Peter, Patreon member Peter here from Texas, but not Sunflower, unfortunately. This book is wild. You guys picked extraordinarily well this time. A nice, short, cozy mystery for the holidays is just right, and I could tell from paragraph one we are in for a treat. I just wanted to point out the striking similarity between the cover art depiction of Murphy and my own dog, Riley. Mm. He's a Bernoodle versus a St. Burdoodle, but all these doodles look the same anyway. And he has given us, uh, been kind enough to send us a picture of uh, his dog, and then he's holding up a, uh, a picture of his own dog next to it. I'm going to send it to you right now, and I'll post wow. it on the episode. Okay. But it's a uh, uncanny resemblance. I feel like Sussy might owe him some royalties from this if it obviously wasn't a uh, stock photo image. Holy, of yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah i on the uh site for the what is it a saint bernoodle bernoodle uh-huh. uh they, they were um they were more expensive the dogs this is a breeding farm if they had some patches on them oh wow they're That's like eighteen hundred dollars there were a thousand for just like one of these interesting but they were like eighteen hundred if you wanted it colored or something wow like that. so like... weird Handcrafted uh, yeah. refractor uh, card version, the, uh, yeah, the metal Charizard Pokemon card. Uh, here is one from Kate. Uh, this is uh, related to our last book. I was just watching the Rift Tracks movie, I Believe in Santa Claus, which, as you may remember, is pretty nuts and has some major Larry and Denise energy. It's the one with Santa and the ogre and the fairy. And a oh, crying the French business. One, the French Canadian or French? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think so. Stop all your crying business. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stop all your crying business. <laughs> but yeah. what really struck me this time was the little boy trying to get his parents back from being held hostage in Africa. Mm-hmm. This is a Christmas movie if you haven't seen it. Um, the fairy asks him, your ma- papa and mama, where are they? The boy says, in Africa. She says, of course, but where in Africa? He just says, just Africa. And that's the end of the scene. It's around the 32-minute mark. So now I'm imagining that's what Larry said every time anyone questioned him about geography, just Africa. I don't remember that. <laughs> no, wow. it's amazing. I've got to take another look. It, it'll, uh, if I watch it, it's going to be for that moment and not for the fairy, for the fairy queen. For um, the fairy uh, queen. She's, yeah. Uh, that was from Kate. This one's from Vince. It's also related to the Ellis's. Over my post-Thanksgiving vacation, I decided to take the plunge and purchase this book. Um, what is it called? Oh, I it's the book um, that Denise wrote under her other name. Uh, it's called like Sex uh, Confessions of a Cheater or something. Oh, no. That's so he right. bought it. He says, yes, I am a true 372 sicko. I had concerns this would turn out to be a true story, one that would forever erase from my mind the vision of the Ellis's as a dysfunctional but loving sitcom couple. Fortunately, it is a work of fiction. 
a four, a four chapter anthology in which different women recount their experiences with husbands who are in order verbally abusive, a serial philanderer, a drunken spousal abuser, and an internet porn addict. Ah. These are, of course, very serious subjects, and I have no doubt D, a.k.a. Denise, was trying her hardest to make a book, an inspiration to women trapped in abusive marriages, but it's also so undeniably Ellis that I can't imagine anyone finding comfort in it. It's essentially Antigua or the teen archaeologists with sex, graphic violence, and vulgar language. Oh, no. Most of the Ellis Tullishes we've come to love are featured heavily. Lists of names, such as Mitch's best friends, Willie, Bubba, Antoine, and Quandell. <laughs> Constant bickering, like, Wanda, you're a hot mess, Charlotte said sarcastically. Damn, you're such a whore. Wow. And even the use of the word non-caringly. The women who narrate each chapter appear to have some type of omniscience as they frequently recount conversations and events they were not present for, including in one instance, the brutal shotgun murder of the narrator's own father, <laughs> which she then hastens to mention remains unsolved. Sort of like the accident in this book. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, all four of our protagonists find a way to escape their abusive relationship with the help of God and encourage each other and others in their circumstances to do the same. He says, I can't recommend the novel, but if you laugh at the thought of the woman who brought you Charlie the Octopus and Nero the Mopec Child writing things like stink whore and fat slut or describing a five-year-old girl marching about the house chanting, mommy is the worthless piece of shit, you might want to check it out. Uh, in closing, there are very few, if other, teenagers in this book. I don't know if that tips the scales any way or another. So that's exciting. <laughs> wow. For, that is taking the uh, ball for the team here. Shock. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I think I'll leave that one. I don't think I ever want to see. Yeah, it I, might I know diminish there now, yeah. in their in their eyes. Wow. Uh, it's more of a lifetime than a Hallmark book, I guess. <laughs> yes. This is from Jeffrey. He has finished this book that we're reading, uh, and was per I finished this book and was per perusing the extensive also by section at the back. Like uh, if you're reading the ebook, that uh, like the last you know ten percent of the book is like descriptions of her other books. When I came across this absolute gem, Pink Blue Bonnets, the first book in the Grist Mill series. For fans of small town mystery comes a Christian fiction novel about five retired friends who are pulled from retirement to confront the sinister shadow world where they, they become the target of a sex trafficking syndicate. <laughs> And then Jeffrey writes in all caps, why the hell are we, aren't we reading The Golden Girls Meet Bleriana? He says, needless to say, this book has rocketed to the top of my reading list. I'll report back. And then he sent another email as he started reading. The book begins with the main character leading a group on a tour of a grist mill and the surrounding town. You get every single word of the tour speech. It's amazing. So, wow. Oh, wait. So I'm, I uh, scroll down to it. Okay. Because I didn't see anything from the books. Trust me, I did not. Okay, good. Phew. Uh, Pink Blue Bonnets? That's That's it? this one, the first yeah, book in the, the first book. Whole series. Excerpt. Okay, there's the excerpt. Okay. <laughs> wow, uh, that's pretty amazing. So, okay. yeah, I'm glad that we're, we're providing her with uh, grist for her own mill in terms of being able to write more of these books. Right now, there are three books in the Grist Mill series. So that's Secrets exciting. of the Carousel. Okay. A story and of strong, courageous friends pursuing their Texas roots. Found a long journey home. The third book in the Grist Mill series is the continuing saga of the story of the power of friendship. A newcomer arrives in Grist Mill, Texas. She brings a challenge to the status quo, and she's searching for a past and a family she never knew. I'm just going to read the, the next sentence. Kelly and Jesse and some more of their sassy senior friends are back. Oh, <laughs> sassy. <laughs> Oh, these ones have, uh, yeah, the interesting looking covers. Secrets Ooh, of the Carousel all, in particular. Wait, all caps. They are replacing him with a new pastor. A woman pastor. <laughs> the pastor is a woman? <laughs> wow. D uh, Donald Sobel uh, nods uh, in approval. He blew my mind. All right. Well, there's uh, encouraging things in the author's uh, bibliography then. Yeah, that's good. Uh, that's it for email. Let's do dumb sentences. Flattery dumb sentences baby. submitted by our listeners. This one's first one's from Brian. This is one I also could not parse. Sometimes Uncle Kid, who has no children, thinks that the answer is the solution when it only inflames the situation. <laughs> I'm not sure. What, I forget what that was referring to, but it was early on in the book. Um, it doesn't make much sense. Uh, this is from Valentari and Bart. Uh, they said this is might be cheating, but their dumb sentence comes from the back cover of the book. 
<laughs> uh, he, parentheses, the sheriff, believes Santa was truly a jolly old elf loved by everyone. And I think Valentari said, no, he doesn't. I read the book. The sheriff believes that Santa was truly an 82-year-old clumsy drunk judge. <laughs> uh, Theodore submitted he's 82 years old, but as he says, he's not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> He also said, if a dead man is walking around your house, you do, you have a problem. And Justin said, also submitted, he says it about himself in the third person. It's also a very clever foreshadowing tool. Uh, Janelle submitted, they look like two hippie pixies. Uh, Jennifer submitted, Douglas, since you are our security person and handyman, we need you to check out our security cameras and get the app set up with Darby's phone. Uh, Craig submitted, Uncle Kid never moved away, but my mother, Aunt Lucy, and Marisol's mother, Aunt Lindy, moved to Austin and went to the University of Texas and raised their family. Presumably, Jim Dalen was involved in that. Um, Loki, some... if, if anyone has a solution to that, that's like the uh, the fox, the grain, and the thing puzzle, right? <laughs> yes. Like, wait. <laughs> well, you moved to Texas. Yep. With but, three people, but you bring the thing back to the hacienda, then you take the two, you know, it's yeah. like... It's My mother, so... where is she? She's never, I don't know if she's ever mentioned again. Hopefully we get her. Maybe she comes back to town at the end of it to help her solve it. Wow. Uh, Loki submitted, do you have his last name address and his social security number? And <laughs> also pointed out that uh, that, of course, is completely illegal. Jenny and Elliot pointed out, uh, yes. But Divine Catering said he didn't show up to work today, and they gave me his full name, Bailey Fox, along with his address and social security number. He gave them when he went to work for them. <laughs> uh, Jan submitted, this was preceded by Boom Pop, but just submitted, Silence! <laughs> and they're curious what that sounds like with an exclamation mark. Uh, Todd submitted, this is again, comes. there's probably some context required, but speculated Uncle Kid. That, that was a second <laughs> sentence in the book. <laughs> uh, Hayden submitted from around, sorry, from about 30 minutes prior to Ed's death, I was outside on the patio and around the Yule log. And he said, around it? Like a snake? <laughs> like <laughs> uh, Mandy submitted, children were already peeking inside, anxious to get started. And she says, I know we hate to make fun of FIPOs, but peaking is spelled the P -A -K. wrong K. Yeah, yeah. she yeah. imagined the kids all twitchy and anxious because they were super high <laughs> uh amanda submitted one of you that you pointed out did santa get into a tussle <laughs> uh jeffrey submitted okay this is it uh just then J J janet crosby hands in the air came running from the hallway rushed into the gathering room and screamed i think santa is dead and he said, it is the first and only appearance and mention of Janet Crosby in the book. Keith submitted, Judge Ed was old, after all, and seniors tend to fall a lot. A Mike lot. <laughs> right, it's usually like one big one that does them in, you know? Yes. <laughs> Mike submitted, as I looked, I could see Judge Ed sprawled on the floor, and there was blood and hair on the bedpost. And Mike said, if you tell us you see something, you don't need to tell us that you were looking at it as you saw it. It's... <laughs> usually how this works uh heather submitted something from the dedication dedicated mm. to the little child's christmas spirit in all of us and she just said this story has santa cracking his head open on a bedpost with blood pooling under his body perfect for the little child's christmas spirit oh the little kids peeking in <laughs> <laughs> edward submitted the occasion called for us to dress up not our jeans and t-shirts that didn't call for your T-shirts and jeans to dress up. I, I, moving on. <laughs> hey, and, look, even Simon put a shirt on. You know, <laughs> he, that guy. And then Beth and Harrison uh, both submitted, I suppose when you kill Santa, that puts a damper on your party. And said, you and you appear to be referring to the same person, so our narrator must be the killer. Uh, I had one uh, marked. It was uh, Ed before Sheriff Ed before his death saying, is this the location where you want me to read the book, The Nightmare Before Christmas? Sorry. Is this the location where you want me to read the book, The Nightmare Before... Sorry, God damn it! I did it twice. <laughs> Is this the location where you want me to read the book, The Night Before Christmas? It's not as dumb as I made it sound by blowing it the first two times, but it is funny for him to address it as the book and then give her the title as if she doesn't know what he's talking about. That was a good movie, An Inconvenient Truth from Birdemic. It reminded me of that one. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, I have a, uh, this is, I figured everything would be uh, covered, so I just thought this was funny. When she goes in to argue with Sheriff Grayson, and I'm like, we have the footage and all of this. And he's like, I don't, I don't care. You know, he's Tommy Lee Jones. I uh-huh. don't care. <laughs> she, he says, you mean when, this is context, but it's just one sentence. Yeah, yeah. You mean when Ed accidentally fell and hit his head, said Sheriff Grayson? Whatever, I mumbled. <laughs> <laughs> that just struck me as funny. Like, She's a surly a tough, teen all of a sudden. So she's like, whatever. Whatever. I don't even like him. <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> delicious smiling. Whatever. I don't care. God. Uh, I whatever I want. Whatever. God. Yeah, right. <laughs> all right. A, a cozy Napoleon Christmas. Well, <laughs> let's finish it for next time. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody.